So good afternoon, uh, friends, uh, and welcome to our India-Nepal uh, military cooperation webinar. This is a webinar on military cooperation between two friends, India and Nepal. Uh, we have done other webinars with uh, Nepalese friends in the recent past, but this subject, of course, is of great interest to uh, our military colleagues as well as uh, civilian uh, colleagues. Uh, it's a subject that reminds us of this very deep-rooted and ancient friendship and relationship between India and Nepal. It conjures up images of uh, brave Gorkha soldiers uh, who have actually uh, made both uh, Nepal and India very proud of their performances in various wars around the world. Uh, so today I'm very happy to welcome this very distinguished uh, group of panelists that we have. I've already mentioned the Nepalese uh, uh, panelists. Uh, I haven't missed any from their side. Uh, from our side, we have Ambassador Rakesh Sood, uh, Lieutenant General Shokin Chauhan, uh, and Dr. Nihar Nayak. Uh, from the Nepalese side, we have uh, Mr. Geja Sharma Wagle, Major General Binoj Basnyat, and uh, uh, Mr. Sunil KC. And hopefully, very soon, we will have uh, Dr. Shamburam Simkhada as well. Uh, a few housekeeping uh, chores. Uh, we have a, a very interesting uh, session ahead. And to uh, you know, make it uh, very fruitful and outcome oriented, I would all request you. Uh, I would request you all to kindly uh, switch off your uh, mics, keep them on mute until you are invited to speak. Uh, I would also request uh, you to see if it's possible to switch off your own mobile phones uh, so that uh, you are not disturbed while you are speaking. Uh, I request uh, attendees, uh, the participants, to use the Q and A box for uh, the questions uh, that they would like to pose to panelists, and if possible, identify the panelists uh, to whom it is uh, addressed. Uh, I have been asked to say a few words uh, uh, to begin this uh, webinar, and I think I should begin by saying that uh, uh, this uh, webinar has in part been occasioned by the uh, visit, uh, forthcoming visit uh, tomorrow of uh, the Chief of Army Staff, uh, General Narawane, who is uh, scheduled to visit uh, Nepal. Uh, this is his uh, first visit. Uh, this is uh, obviously uh, a, a, a routine visit uh, in, in itself because the army chief uh, uh, normally visits Nepal uh, soon after assuming office. Uh, and as you know, uh, the uh, chief of the Indian Army is uh, made an honorary general of the uh, Nepal Army by the President of uh, Nepal. Uh, and you are aware that uh, in January this year, uh, on the 12th of January, if I'm not mistaken, the Chief of the Nepal Army uh, likewise had visited India. And uh, our President had also made him an honorary general of the Indian Army. So that's an old uh, a tradition that has been in place for many years. Uh, as close neighbors, India and Nepal share very unique ties of friendship and cooperation. These are characterized by an open border and deep-rooted people-to-people contacts of kinship and culture. Uh, there has been a long tradition of free movement of people across the borders. Uh, the border itself is, of course, as you all know, uh, a very long border, uh, 1,850 kilometers. Um, and uh, Nepal shares this border with five Indian states. Sikkim, West Bengal, Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, and Uttarakhand. Uh, nearly 2 million Nepalese citizens live and work in India, uh, and uh, around 1 million Indians also live in Nepal. Uh, the India-Nepal Treaty of Peace and Friendship of 1950, uh, it institutionalized century-old special relations that exist between our two countries, and uh, uh, Nepalese citizens can avail facilities and opportunities uh, on par, at par with Indian citizens in accordance with the provisions of the treaty. Uh, another special feature, uh, the one that we devote ourselves today to uh, in our discussions, uh, is uh, the bilateral relationship uh, in the uh, field of, uh, uh, you know, the, the military field, the military sphere. Um, I can now see that uh, uh, Dr. Shambhu Ram Shimkhada has also joined us uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Simkhada. Very warm welcome to you. I'm, I'm glad that you were able to uh, overcome the technical problem and very grateful to you for joining us. 
Um, high level exchanges, if I may continue, high level exchanges between India and Nepal uh, have been, uh, you know, a very marked feature of our bilateral engagement and especially since the present government uh, assumed office uh, in India. Prime Minister Modi has visited Nepal twice in 2014 and again in 2018. And if uh, I could uh, uh, draw your attention to the fact uh, uh, that uh, the 2014 visit was the first by any Indian Prime Minister in uh, 17 years. So that was uh, quite a milestone in itself. Um, India and Nepal have several bilateral institutional dialogue mechanisms, including the India-Nepal Joint Commission. And there are, uh, in general, regular parliamentary exchanges, people-to-people -people, uh, exchanges, uh, many of which uh, at this stage have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but I uh, would uh, assume that uh, this uh, will soon be overcome and uh, our exchanges will um, revert back to their normal uh, levels once the pandemic is uh, under control. Uh, I myself had the great uh, pleasure of uh, visiting Nepal in March uh, at the start of the pandemic, and uh, I had very useful exchanges, all round exchanges with uh, scholars, uh, diplomats, officials, think tanks, uh, and came back with uh, a very, very positive uh, assessment of the future of our ties. Um, we have, during the pandemic, as you know, extended humanitarian support uh, to Nepal. Uh, the Prime Minister of India held a video conference with leaders of SARC member states uh, to discuss a strategy to combat the pandemic. And he had a telephonic uh, conversation uh, with uh, uh, Prime Minister Oli as well uh, on the 10th of uh, April 2020. And they both agreed to keep the supply chain intact during this, this period of uh, unprecedented crisis. Um, we, on our part, as in the government of India, has assured uh, the government of Nepal of uh, our fullest assistance, including the supply of medicines uh, in this uh, time of uh, uh, grave uh, challenge and need. India has already provided 23 tons of essential uh, medication to Nepal. Um, we have sent uh, life-saving ventilators, uh, special medicines, uh, COVID-19 test kits, etc., including for the Nepali um, army, by the way. And uh, Indian security agencies at the border have also been extending all possible support to Nepali migrant workers uh, waiting to cross the borders. In defense cooperation, which is the subject of our webinar uh, today, you're all aware that we have always had wide ranging cooperation in this field. India has been um, uh, trying its best to assist the Nepal army uh, in its modernization by supplying equipment and providing uh, necessary training facilities, assistance during disasters, joint military exercises, adventure activities, and bilateral visits are other aspects of our close defense cooperation. A number of defense personnel from Nepal attend uh, training courses in various uh, Indian Army training institutions. Um, the Indo-Nepal battalion level joint military exercise Surya Kiran is conducted uh, um, alternately in uh, um, India and in Nepal. The 14th Surya Kiran exercise was held uh, in December 2019 in Nepal. And since 1950, India and Nepal have been awarding, as I said before, um, the rank of uh, honorary general to uh, the army chief uh, of the other side. Uh, this is, of course, in recognition of the uh, mutual uh, harmonious uh, relationship that exists between the two armies. Uh, we, of course, have experts today who will speak on this, but I might also add here that the uh, Gorkha regiments of the Indian Army, uh, you know, especially uh, the brave soldiers who come from Nepal, uh, about 32,000 Gorkha soldiers from Nepal, uh, they have really acquitted themselves uh, uh, very well. They've covered themselves in glory, uh, both in peace times and in times of, uh, of war. Uh, there are about seven regiments, as I understand, in the Indian Army. Uh, the UK uh, has gone down from four regiments to now just one regiment with two uh, battalions. Um, and uh, uh, the uh, Indian Army maintains about 25, 25 
district soldier boards in Nepal, all functioning uh, in tandem with uh, the defense attache uh, in our embassy there. Uh, to arrange for the disbursement of pensions and to organize welfare programs for retraining, rehabilitation, uh, assisting uh, the soldiers and their families uh, in multiple and, and myriad ways. So all this and more uh, will be covered today by our distinguished panelists. Uh, and uh, without much further ado, I therefore want to thank you all once again for joining us at this webinar on India-Nepal military cooperation. And I would like to begin by requesting uh, our, our uh, distinguished uh, colleague from Nepal, Dr. Shamburam uh, Simkhada, uh, to kindly uh, address uh, the webinar and to use uh, 15 minutes, if possible, uh, to deliver his uh, remarks and observations. Um, Dr. Uh, Shamburam Simkhada uh, is, uh, has been convener of the Eminent Persons Council and also permanent representative of Nepal to the United Nations, uh, the WTO and other international organizations in Geneva. He's had a distinguished career, as you can see, including as chairman of the UNHRC, uh, and he's also been Nepal's ambassador to Switzerland. So with these few words, I now request our first speaker, Dr. Shamburam uh, Shimkada, if I may call you Ambassador uh, Shimkada, to uh, very kindly address uh, this webinar. 15 minutes. Uh, is the time available for you. Thank you very much. May I please request you to unmute yourself, please? May I request you to unmute yourself? Thank you. Am I okay? Yes, perfect. Very good. As I was uh, saying, first of all, Namaskar. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I missed a little bit of uh, Ambassador Chinari's uh, uh, earlier uh, introductory remarks, but I got no, most of it. And uh, knowing his very distinguished career, and of course the, the kind of depth uh, he has of uh, uh, you know of uh, Indo-Nepal relations, he has covered quite a lot. So I will. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm a bit um, weak in technology, so as a result, I have sent the. Um, the organizers in the in Nepal, uh, a short uh, PowerPoint uh, for their projection, uh, and they tell me that uh, uh, they can't do it, so I have to do it on my own. I don't know how to do it, so I'll just read from it. Well, first of all, I wanted to uh, start by exchanging greetings. Nepal has just uh, finished uh, celebrating our biggest festival, the Sai. Uh, as part of India has the Durga Puja. And of course, we are about to uh, enter uh, the festival season of Dipavali and Diwali. So I exchange greetings um, and um, especially at this time when both countries, we are going through in a difficult uh, COVID-19 pandemic and of course being affected by uh, so much by it. So the festival of lights will bring uh, uh, inspiration for all of us to get over this uh, um, this experience and this this pandemic. The reason I started with the greetings of the festivals is the festivals are also characterization of our very common civilizational bonds, and of course the deep rooted and wide ranging relationship between Nepal and India. And of course, such a deep rooted and wide ranging relationship uh, obviously presupposes a very strong security relationship. And the relations between the two armies, the two militaries, the topic of the, of the webinar today, its evolution and its future prospect uh, is, a, is a reflection of that close friendship at all levels of our state to state and people to people relationship. Now this relationship obviously goes back uh, to the times of uh, British India. And of course the role the Nepali army uh, has played uh, um, in uh, starting from the time of India's uh, independence and consolidation. 
as Ambassador Chinoy rightly men mentioned, the exchange of the honorary general title of the chief of the army staffs of the two countries, the reciprocal arrangement is again another reflection of that. Soon we will have um, India's army chief of staff in Nepal to receive that honorary title, which we are very much looking forward to, to convey our deep sort of friendship and express the strong bond of relationship between the two armies, but also between the two countries. You've highlighted a whole range of other uh, issues that bind the two uh, countries and of course the two uh, militaries together. So I don't need to really go into, uh, um, into that. Simply to state that it's a very strong bond between the two militaries and the two armies that exist today. And of course, the topic of our discussion, I would imagine, is how can we further strengthen? What are the prospects of this strengthening exercise in the days to come? Now, to discuss about that topic, obviously, India and Nepal are both democracies. I know from the history of India that, in fact, the Indian Army, the military, and its unflinching support to the democratic process is one of the strongest factors that makes India a enduring democracy globally, as an example. In fact, while democracies are being challenged all over the world in different ways, that in India is sometime I, the two role of the two uh, Indian institutions. One, of course, is the army. The secondly, the Indian Election Commission. How India organizes that, you know, uh, that supreme exercise in democracy is really truly amazing. So it is in this background, and of course the important role of the Nepal army also in strengthening the ongoing political transition in Nepal, very positive role of the Nepal army in that process. I think this has to be kept in mind. So the point is, while we discuss the prospects of uh, the relationship between the two militaries. In my view, it can only be a part of the larger, broader gamut of relationship between the two countries. As I said, the deep-rooted, the wide-ranging uh, friendship between the two, um, two countries. So seen from the perspective of this perspective, from a normal interstate relationship, I have often described Nepal-India relation as magic. The border, the open border that was discussed earlier, is a case in point. The free exchange and movement of people across the border uh, is another one. During the festival, so many people came from India those who were working in India, and now quite a lot of them are returning. This is an example of how open and magical this relationship has been. So the question that I want to sort of address, and Ambassador Chinoy, today I am not wearing any of my hats, either the ambassadorial hat or in fact the Nepali hat. I'm speaking purely as an, as an intellectual. And as a result, I want to be pretty candid about Things, so that if we are really talking about the prospects of strengthening relationship between two countries and the two militaries, then of course, in an exchange of ideas like this, that we need to be pretty uh, open about it. So in that sense, this relationship that I call magical, why is once in a while this relationship misjudged, mismanaged, to the point of a mess. And the two recent events, 2015 and the recent border issue, are cases in point. Now, luckily, the role of the two militaries have been, despite some of the difficulties that we have on a larger political and diplomatic fronts, 
the role of the militaries have been positive all along, starting from the time of the British rule in India. I was just reading a history of how this uh, honorary title started. Uh, there is a nice article by a historian in the Nepali press where he outlines that during 1885 to 1993, the relationship between the Nepali palace and the uh, British resident in Kathmandu deteriorated to the point that in fact the governor general was forced to include an agenda in the uh, Council of British India about Nepal's sovereignty. And it was then that the chief of the army, British army chief of staff, very vehemently opposed any discussion on that topic. And that reflecting the deep relationship between the two militaries. He not only emphasized the continuing cooperation of the Gorkha army to the British, but in fact, he highlighted how the Russian threat was growing. And as a result, if there was to be a conflict with Russia of British India, that in fact, the help of the Gorkha army was essential. And as a result, any, dis any debate in the council, uh, British Council on, uh, on India on Nepal's sovereignty would be highly counterproductive. And as a result, he vehemently opposed that. And subsequently, the governor general decided to completely uh, take out that agenda from the uh, at all. So that is uh, uh, a historic point. We know what happened in two, 2015, the important role of the Nepal army, and of course, the, with the support of the Indian army, uh, the early lifting of the blockade. So these uh, are examples of how that history exists. As I mentioned, despite the fact that there is a general lack of movement on the political and diplomatic front, especially after the uh, eruption of the border issue, the fact that Chief of Army Staff General Narvane's visit is taking place at this time is again another example that in fact, while on a broader front, this beautiful magical relationship gets messed up once in a while, that in fact, the two armies have remained cordial. And as a result, this is a reflection that the two armies and of course the two countries want to move beyond this uh, immediate sort of situation. And in fact, restore the wide ranging and deep rooted friendly relations that have always existed between our two countries. So this highest level visit uh, after the, uh, the border development, in fact, is a very clear sign of the both governments moving in that direction. And of course, we all, while this deadlock was going on, I published a piece called Free Peace to Reset India-Nepal Relations. And one of them was to prevent both sides from making statements, from doing things that would adversely affect this close relationship and friendship. And on the basis of that, that in fact, we need to move progress in the future. And so as a result, I'm very delighted that this visit is taking place. Now, as a student, as a practitioner, and subsequently as a teacher of international relations, I have often been known to talk about what I call a transformative thinking in IR, in international relations. And the question that I raised earlier, why does such a beautiful relationship, such a magical relationship, get messed up once in a while? The underlying fact is the notion of national interest. Obviously, India and Nepal, as two sovereign, independent countries, conduct their foreign policies on the basis of what they perceive as in their best national interest. It's quite natural. 
this famous saying in foreign policy, there are no permanent friends or permanent enemies. There are only permanent interests. Now, I happen to view that this 17th century idea that was enunciated initially by British scholar politician, later British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, which later became much more popularized by Lord Palmstone, needs to be redefined in the Indian Nepal context, primarily because I see no relevance of the idea of enmity between Nepal and India. It's such inextricable bonds of history, geography, culture, politics, and economics. So as a result, I would like to redefine this very notion in a way that our national interest, national interest of both countries, by the way, is best protected by permanent friendship. Now, if understood and managed well, I argue that, in fact, the two most significant developments, one, the 1950 Treaty of Peace and Friendship, and second, Nepal's proposal to make Nepal a zone of peace, were, in fact, both motivated, are both motivated by this complementary idea of India's need and desire for a permanent friendship with Nepal, so that there is no threat emanating out of the Nepali territory to India's security. And Nepal's aspiration and Nepal's view that this is best achieved if there is perpetual peace and tranquility and stability. This is what these two very, very good ideas actually meant. But because we cannot see that we oftentimes become prisoners of the past, prisoners of geography, prisoners of history, that in fact, the biggest lesson of history is to learn its lesson. And if we are able to learn that lesson, only then we can understand the true meaning of this new thing. That is the, the issue of transformation, transformative uh, international relations to talk about. And that is why my piece called Decoding the Matrix of Nepal-India Relations, the SRS conundrum, is basically meant to decode that relationship. Now, if you look at it from a larger perspective, that is what the, the tragedies of the two world wars brought. And in fact, the visionary thinkers of that time visionary leaders of that time established the UN to institutionalize this notion called national interest harmonization. That in fact, in the 21st century, with the dynamics of time and technology, no single country, irrespective of how powerful, can single-handedly resolve some of the issues of environment, climate, terror, with implication on security and so on. So as a result, this idea called national interest harmonization is what we need in terms of our transformation thinking. Now, when we talk, bring this to the context of the relationship between Nepal and India, and most specifically focused on the relationship between the two armies, Nepal's location, location, between India and China is a fact of geography. It is also an objective reality that as the second largest economy, soon to be the first, China has already, as a result, seat at the global high table. And I have absolutely no doubt, and I'm all for it, that in fact, India will soon reclaim and get its rightful place there. Now in this prize of our two neighbors, what is the nature of the relationship that India and China want to follow with each other? 
Do they want to go the same way as Western articulation of conflict and wars as the inevitable processes of the rise and fall of the great powers? Or should we reflect on a much more oriental wisdom oriented foreign policy of coexistence? Now, in saying that, I do not dispute the fact. And in fact, you know, interestingly, Western scholarship, for instance, Paul Kennedy and Samuel Huntington will not agree in most things intellectually. But there is one place where they both categorically agree. That is, a small country like island like Britain was able to conquer and in fact rule such vast parts of the world, not necessarily because of the superiority of Western values, but their military power, military strength. So in that sense, I do not dispute the fact that both India and China, of course, want to build strong militaries to defend their rising place in the world. But the question that comes to my mind it should that then lead to a outdated hegemonic and conflictual polarity or should we think about a new model of competitive of course rising powers will there will be compet competition but a managed competition with cooperative plurality that is the question and in concluding that as it relates to, I bring it back, this broader notion to the context of uh, uh, Nepal-India relations, and of course, the relationship between the two armies. One is the idea of what I call the paradox of Pakistan. Because we are so close, that we are so inextricably interlinked by a whole range of issues, that there is obviously that makes our relationship, India-Nepal relationship, so vital, so important. But that also makes it rather complex. There are a number of complexities that are inherent in India-Nepal. Size is obviously one. India, whether some of the people in Nepal like it or not, is a great power, has always been a great power. And it's going to be a great power, and in fact, a superpower. On the other hand, Nepal is situated between two countries and of course a very relatively very small one. And as a result, there are these small uh, country syndromes. So the sensitivity with which we need to manage this is I think critical. Two more minutes, this, a minute I'm, or two I'm, more I'm, minutes. I'm concluding, Thank you. I'm concluding. Thank you. In this uh, perspective, as I said earlier, in the beginning. The two militaries have excellent relationship and we need to strengthen it further. That relationship will largely depend on the nature of the relationship between India and China. I mean, India and uh, Nepal, India and China, India and Nepal. Now, in all of this transformative direction, I see the centrality of India in fact the only country with the possibility to direct future international relations because China and US seem to have you know sort of uh, decided to go their different ways and in this sense what will be the nature of Nepal India relations in this new context will obviously affect the nature of the relationship between our, our two armies and between our two militaries and I'm all in favor. Incidentally, I'm also uh, now involved in the National Defense University um, in, in Nepal. And of course, my one of my ideas is, in fact, I believe the world needs a transformation, a transformative thinking, if it is to avoid some of the same tragedies, either of wars or of foreign subjugation, which India, of course, is not um, unaware of. Uh, with this, um, Ambassador Chino, I'm really uh, delighted that uh, uh, 
uh, you thought of me to share some of my very kind of scattered uh, thoughts on the topic. And of course, I wish uh, Nepal-India relations and of course the relationship between the two armies all best wishes. And again, as I said, we are very much uh, looking forward to the visit of uh, uh, Chief uh, Narwani and uh, a successful visit to Nepal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador uh, Simkhada. Uh, you have actually delivered uh, a very magisterial, uh, you know, presentation. Uh, and I suspect that this could be perhaps uh, material for your next book. Is that uh, something that you're planning? Uh, for you actually given us a very broad overview of our bilateral relations and you also very successfully juxtaposed our bilateral ties in the evolving regional and international situation. Uh, and at the same time, all that you've said gives me such great hope uh, for the future of uh, what you've described as uh, a magical relationship. Uh, the sheer magic of our ties will ensure that uh, we remain uh, what we are, friends forever. Thank you very much for those very perceptive remarks. I now turn to Ambassador Rakesh Sood, uh, who has uh, had a, a very distinguished career in the Indian Foreign Service, uh, uh, and he's currently distinguished fellow at uh, the ORF. Uh, and he, as you all know, uh, dear friends from Nepal, he was our ambassador to Nepal as well, among many other assignments that he uh, held with equal distinction. I request Ambas Ambassador Sood to take all of 15 minutes, please, to deliver his remarks. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sujan. And uh, let me first of all uh, thank you and IDSA for inviting me uh, for this very topical uh, webinar. It is a pleasure to meet old friends, especially uh, my good friend, Ambassador Simkada. After a long time, it's good to see you, Shambhu, and good, good to, to hear you, from you. Great to see you. Thank you. Uh, let me pick up a couple of points from uh, what uh, Ambassador Simkada said and take it forward from there. I think it is quite clear. Um, he said that uh, a strong security relationship that has existed between India and Nepal is a uh, in a sense, is part of a stronger old political, civilizational, historical, cultural relationship. Now, so uh, I know we are focused much more on the relationship, the military to military relationship. So we will try and keep it to that extent. But I think it is important to keep in mind that uh, if the larger political relationship is undergoing a stress and strain, and then somewhere or the other, it may reflect on this as well, because after all, this is a subset of it. The second thing, I think, a uh, very important thing that uh, Ambassador Simkhada said, and I would like to flag that, he said uh, that the national interests of both India and Nepal is served by a relation by a relationship of permanent friendship between the two countries but then he went on to uh, uh, bring in the china factor into it and and so on and i think it is important to keep that also at the back of our mind now having uh, flagged these two issues let me say that um, the relationship between, just as the relationship between India and Nepal uh, is uh, a relationship that in a sense, we, India in inherited in 1947. Similarly, the relationship, uh, the military to military relationship is also something that we inherited because uh, the British Indian Army had a number of Gurkha regiments at the time of uh, Indian independence. Um, may, may I just request uh, Ambassador Shambhu to mute your uh, mic, please? Thank you. Oh, yes, sorry, sorry. Thank you. That's all right. It, it, this way we can get rid of any uh, static or echoes. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Please continue, Rakesh. Please continue. 
Yeah, as I was saying, so in 1947, actually, there was a tripartite agreement between uh, UK, India, and Nepal, which sort of said, all right, these are the six regiments, six British Indian Gurkha regiments that came to India. Four of them were retained uh, by UK. And also included in that was the uh, tradition of annual recruitment. And as you very rightly pointed out, Sujan, I mean, there are about 32,000 um, Nepalese uh, citizens who serve the, in the Gurkha regiments of the Indian Army today with great distinction, honor, and uh, are very, very valued members of the Indian Armed Forces. So just as this is an inheritance, as it were, a legacy from uh, prior to 1947, similarly, the 1950 treaty about which you spoke about and also Ambassador Simkhada spoke about is in many ways also a legacy of uh, pre-1947 period because not, I would like to mention this because I think it is important for our audience and others to remember that British India had a very special relationship with Nepal in the sense that uh, while Nepal was a sovereign country, there was also a British political agent who was appointed there, who had been there for uh, since after the Treaty of Sugoli to advise the King of Nepal regarding foreign policy and security related issues. So in a sense, it was a sovereign state. It was not uh, occupied by the British, but there was a certain constraint on Nepal's foreign policy, security policy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that had been imposed by the appointment of the British political agent. And I think Shambhu also talked of how uh, there were ups and downs in the relationship between the palace and the British political agent from time to time. Now this relationship also got evolved over a period of time and the last major treaty that british india had with nepal was the 1923 treaty so obviously and you know these are the treaties that led to the open border and a whole host of other things and so in 1947 when india became independent there was a natural interest in looking at how independent india would have its relationship with nepal and these treaties sort of got rolled into what became the 1950 Peace and Friendship Treaty. Once again, a legacy uh, from British India. Now, uh, there is no denying the fact that we have seen ups and downs. The world has changed a lot since 1947. India has changed a lot. Nepal has changed a lot. So our region has changed. The world has changed both countries have changed. Now, the question, therefore, that we need to ask ourselves is, and meanwhile, of course, Nepal has been through enormous political transitions. I mean, I think, in a sense, we have been relatively stable in India. We still have the same constitution that we adopted in 1950. Nepal has been through a number of constitutions, formal constitutions, a number of interim constitutions, and so on. Uh, from a 250-year-old monarchy, it has become a republic. Since 19, I, in fact, often say that the uh, current political transition of Nepal began with the first Janandolan, which was 1990, with the introduction of multi-party democracy. And for, if we look at it, therefore, from 1990 till 2017, the last election where Prime Minister Oli was elected, during those 27 years, um, I would say that Nepal has had 27 prime ministers. Some prime ministers have not even um, spent a year in office. So it has been a tremendous period of political churning. But despite this political churning taking place, the relationship between the two institutions of the Indian Army and the Nepal Army has remained a very stable relationship. And I think a lot of credit for this goes to the 
way in which the institutional leadership of the two armies handled this relationship. So even though this was a legacy relationship, but it was maintained as such, it was honored as such, and in fact, it got even further strengthened because in 1950, the tradition evolved of conferring the rank of the honorary general on each other's army chiefs. General Karyapa was the first Indian army chief to be conferred this rank uh, by the government of Nepal and vice versa. And this tradition has continued since. Now, we know that uh, uh, General Naravne had uh, his, some of his comments in May had generated a certain controversy in Nepal. And I think it was, uh, you know, somewhat uh, unfortunate that this controversy got generated. So I am certainly very happy that he is now going to uh, Kathmandu so that this tradition can be continued. And I think it speaks volumes for the strength of this tradition. Now, this is a very critical point uh, that I'm making, which means that here we have a situation where while there have been certain challenges on the political front because of all the political changes that are taking place, internal political changes that have taken place in Nepal, and uh, also now in a wider regional and global geopolitical sense, here is a relationship between the two institutions that has remained in a sense, somewhat insulated. However, I don't think it can remain permanently insulated because even when I was there, and uh, I, I think uh, General Chauhan and uh, General Basnet would remember this, uh, you know, uh, there was a period in time where because of the Maoist objections, the Indian army, had stopped its recruitment rallies in Nepal. The Maoists had said that we will not allow this. We object to the idea of Nepalese citizens uh, joining foreign armies. And as a result, because they created uh, a security issue out of it, as a result, it was felt uh, this was before I landed up in uh, Nepal, but as a result, it was felt that perhaps it would be better not to carry out these recruitment rallies. It took about two years of uh, <coughs> working with the Maoists and other people, and also mobilizing some of the retired ex-servicemen and uh, their groups who were keen and who felt the weight of this tradition, who felt the value of this tradition quite strongly. And it is they who then were able to prevail upon the local political leaders to say that, look, this is a tradition that we value. And that is how this, after, two year, after a two year gap, this tradition was restored. So I'm just giving this example to show that the overall political relationship will cause strain. So somewhere while the two institutions of the armies need to certainly maintain the strength of this relationship because it is a very valuable relationship. And as Ambassador Simkada said, that if our national interests are served by a permanent friendship, then this relationship becomes a bedrock for that defined permanent friendship. And, but at the same time, we also need to be conscious of the fact that it cannot be completely divorced from the overall political relationship, which also therefore requires an attention to be able to brought back so that it can be brought back on even keel and whatever differences or perceptional gaps exist on both sides, I think, you mentioned the 1950 treaty. It is no secret to the people attending this webinar that the perceptions on 1950 treaty have become quite divergent between the two countries and that it is therefore worth our while in both countries, at least among the people 
who attach value to a strong and positive relationship, who attach value to the idea of a permanent friendship, that we need to bring about this restoration so that the military to military relationships that have withstood this for the time being are do not get any further shocks, but can continue. So in that sense, I'm personally extremely delighted. And I'm quite sure General Naravne, having realized how he had his uh, inadvertent statement had led to a controversy, I'm sure he will be extremely careful this time. I'm sure the Nepali media will try and trip him up. But <laughs> that is quite, uh, Nepali media is known. I mean, you know, if you've been in Nepal, then you realize that uh, Nepali media is very adept at sort of planting questions and then provoking you and things like that. So I'm quite sure that uh, the Nepali media will try and do that. I guess that is their job. But I'm equally confident that General Naravne will be able to maintain a calm and dignified presence and thereby ensure that his presence and the uh, the purpose for which he will be going is something that will add value to our relationship. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Rakesh Sood, for uh, also walking us through uh, the history of our bilateral relations and for also emphasizing the importance of uh, not just uh, military to military ties, which, as you said, are uh, extremely important and very good. Uh, and uh, they act as a factor for stability in our ties, uh, but also the fact that you mentioned that nurturing uh, political level ties uh, is of uh, the utmost importance. And by political ties, I don't really want to limit my own view to political leaders. Uh, political ties really translates into an all of government approach. Uh, so every government department, uh, the states that are bordering Nepal, all of them have to work together with Nepal to uh, better our political ties. Uh, as for media, I dare say that uh, we also have uh, <laughs> the same yes. issues yes. on our side. So I think uh, yes. as far as the media is concerned, I make uh, I draw no distinction between uh, the media of Nepal and the media of India, or for that matter, anywhere else. Uh, well, on that point, I thank you again, uh, Rakesh, for very uh, useful, very good, very informative remarks, as usual. Uh, I expected nothing less from you. Uh, thank you very much. I now turn to, um, uh, we have uh, another Indian speaker uh, lined up, and then we move to uh, a, a Nepal speaker. So I will now request uh, Lieutenant General Shokin Chauhan to deliver his comments. Uh, 15 minutes, please, if you can. Uh, General Chauhan is a decorated military officer of the Gorkha Regiment. And um, some of you might have noticed that uh, before we formally began the proceedings uh, of today's webinar, he was uh, very fluently engaging his friends from Nepal in uh, you know, the uh, Gorkhali language. Uh, and I only envied him. Uh, but look, there is something strange about, uh, uh, you know, Nepali and Gorkhali and all. Some of the vocabulary is uncannily similar. The syntax also, strangely, with Gujarati. Uh, I can't explain why. Uh, so there is a triangulation over there between uh, what they speak and what the Gujarati speak and what the Bengali speak. And in between is vast territory, but nobody can explain why. And uh, maybe we'll do some research on that as well. General uh, Chauhan uh, has served above all, and this is of great interest to uh, all of us, as DA in Nepal. And so he has a direct experience of the military relationship. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Chinoy. Uh, very kind of you to have invited me to attend and participate in this uh, seminar. Uh, thank you for introducing me and uh, also uh, so positively and it's been actually uh, my career uh, of the last 44 years, the high point of my career, that I had the opportunity and the good fortune to have served in the Indian Embassy at Kathmandu. I have been a soldier, as you mentioned, for the last 44 years. But more importantly, which I would like to point out to my Nepalese friends, that I have always identified my career, my background, my demography by my regiment the 11 Gurkha Rifles. Uh, I was born in the regiment. I'm one of the few uh, 
of generals who were born in the regiment. And in fact, learned to speak Nepali before I spoke anything else, helped generously by my Nepali soldiers of my father's regiment. And hence, who himself was a pioneer of the regiment. He was one of the first Indian officers who joined the 11 Good Karaipal when it appeared. I have spent a lot of my time studying Nepal. I was, uh, as a young officer, I used to have this habit of spending a month in Nepal during my annual leave. And I must relate to you one experience, which is, which was so important in my career, uh, which was so importantly positive in my career, that uh, I feel it necessary to tell my Nepali friends how we in the Indian Army perceived them to be. I had gone for this trek uh, to East Nepal, that is from where my soldiers come, the Rise and the Limbus, the Kilati tribe, in December 1983. It was a long time ago. And, uh, you know, we had reached the Arun River, or what we call in Nepal the Arun Kola, which is a very fast flowing river. And unfortunately, it was about seven in the evening, extremely dark in December, extremely cold. And also the boatman or the Maji had you know, taken his boat and gone to the other side of the bank. And here we were alone. I was uh, with my one of my soldiers. We were alone, uh, wondering what to do. Should we go walk it back to the nearest town or should we stay there? We had our sleeping bags, but no overhead cover. There was one house uh, about a kilometer away whose light we could see. Uh, it was a candlelight or a, or a hurricane lamp. And I asked my soldier, I said, look, uh, we have no option. Just go and find out if we can stay the night. And there was this young Nepali girl uh, who had a young, uh, equally very, very young, one month old baby. And the moment she came to know that uh, an Indian army officer was there, she said, yes, of course you can come. There was only one room in the house, but she gave us a place to stay in, in the cow shed. And so we slept in the cow shed. Next morning when I woke up and I was getting ready to leave because the boatman had been called, I asked her, I said, Bahini in Nepali, younger sister, why did you allow two strange men to come to your house? Weren't you afraid of what we do to you? And what she said, uh, you changed my entire perspective in my career. I was a young officer, like I said, a lot of things could have gone wrong. She said, Daju, that is elder brother, uh, when I heard that you are an Indian Army officer, I felt that God had come to my house and that gods don't do wrong things. And it, it was an amazing experience, I, I can tell you. It, 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 it changed my entire thought process and I realized that how we are as officers of the Gurkha regiments, of these very dedicated, fabulous soldiers of Nepal, how we are perceived by them and how they tell people about us. So that has been what, what I would say the beginning of my love affair with Nepal. Posting to Nepal, of course, as a defense attache during 2004 to 2007 uh, was, was a high point. It was difficult because the Jan Andolan came in the way at that time and its aftermath. So when I reached Nepal, it was a functioning, uh, it was a functioning kingdom. It was the kingdom of Nepal. And uh, there was the Royal Nepalese Army that welcomed me. And I was, uh, you know, taken to the king to be welcomed by him. And when I left, it had become a republic. So I at that time. And all I can say is that throughout this very, very difficult time uh, between the relations between us and Nepal, the Indian Army soldiers and the 128,000 Nepalese origin Gurkha soldiers who are now pensioners in Nepal and who are not mentioned by, by anybody remain India's greatest friend and ally. I still remember, and I must mention it here, in 2005, after King Gyanendra had taken over uh, the, the kingdom, uh, the ambassador wanted to go to the, the district of Gorkha. And he was, uh, you know, he asked me, he said, look, uh, you're my DA, can, I want to visit this place. Uh, can you manage it? I said, of course I can. And I spoke to the district soldier board at Gorkha district. And they sat down, they said, of course, we'll welcome the Indian ambassador. And there were more than 35,000 ex-Gurkha soldiers to welcome the ambassador. And they had made 27 gates from the main road going to, going to Pokhara, right, in, right till the town of Gurkha. 
and they welcomed the ambassador to a huge success. And the ambassador was Ambassador Mukherjee was extremely, yeah, you know, he was he was extremely grateful. And he kept asking me, he says, look, I never knew how good these were, how good these soldiers were. And these ex-Indian Army pensioners remain till today, and they will remain till their dying day, India's greatest support, India's greatest asset. And to them, we must continuously look at. We're talking about the security relations. We're talking about an army to army relationship. It is paramount that we continue to maintain that these 128,000 pensioners who along with uh, almost 10 lakh families uh, are extremely important to India and are our greatest support. Yes, as Ambassador Sood mentioned, the recruitment within Nepal had to be stopped, but not because the government told us to, but because the Maoists, the PLA at that time with Prachanda, had said that they would not, they would target our, our recruitment rallies and that the recruitment rallies used to be given security by the Nepalese police. So what I did was after speaking to uh, the, 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 the chief of the Royal Nepalese Army and my own chief, he was young JJ Singh then, uh, I moved the recruitment rally to a small town across across the border, across the Sonoli border. Just 20 kilometers from Sonoli, we had a, we have some land there, and we moved the recruitment rally there and to Darjeeling. And our recruitment continued unabated. So, even if somebody says that you know the recruitment rally should not be done, it doesn't matter because these boys they are brought there by their fathers, by their brothers, by their uncles. And we remain to till today a very important part of their lives. They maintain, and I am absolutely certain because I, I can tell you I have visited Nepal uh, many, many times on treks. They maintain, our, they maintain, and they remain our greatest thing, our greatest support. It was actually the 1951 invasion of Tibet by the PLA that resulted in significant changes of the Nepali relationship with China. And, and China ordered certain restrictions on the entry of Nepalese pilgrims and contacts in Tibet. And Mao reportedly said that Taiwan, Tibet, and Hainan, the Hainan, Hainan Islands were the Chinese territories and would be repossessed. But more importantly, he stated publicly that Tibet was the palm of a hand, and its five fingers were Ladakh, Sikkim, Nepal, Bhutan, and the Northeast, Northeast Frontier Agency. This statement of Mao actually worried King Tribhuvan of Nepal, who invited an Indian military mission to Nepal for reorganizing and modernizing his army. Before King Tribhuvan's takeover, Nepal had no regular army or soldiers. They were actually part-time and when not on duty, followed other professions. Periodically, they were called for parades in Kathmandu, and this army was ill-equipped and ill-paid. It is after the IMM arrived the Indian military mission arrived in Kathmandu on the 28th of uh, 1952. It was tasked to assist in the reorganization of ne the Nepalese army, and it helped in formulating the defensive plans against both internal and external threats. However, due to the political situation, this IMM was considered a sellout to India, which included then the BP Koirala faction of the Nepalese Congress Party. For, by December 1953, the strength of the IMM was about 197. And on the recommendations of, of, the, of the IMM, the IMA, the RNA was downsized to 25,000, from 25,000 soldiers to 6,000 soldiers. And there were 17 check posts, which, which with, Nepal, with Nepalese concurrence, was established along the northern borders of Nepal with China. Why I'm saying it is that there's a deeper relationship. We have always been there. Things have been difficult. Things will be difficult. And as all of you said, there are permanent interests with change in time with the ebb and, ebb and flow of tide. And this will continue to happen. But I agree entirely with Ambassador Shambhu and Ambassador Sood, who highlighted this, that there is this magical relationship. It's a magical relationship because in no other country in the world do we get soldiers from another country. And the best thing is that in no other country do our, our Nepalese or the Nepalese soldiers considered as mercenaries. They are a part of our heart and soul. They're everything to us. 
and it's an amazing relationship that we cherish and we continue and want to cherish. However, by 1965, the Indian Army supplied arms, ammunition, and equipment to the entire Nepalese Army of 17,000, comprising of four reorganized brigades. It catered for the replacement of the existing weapons as well as training. So we've been doing it since 1950. Unfortunately, the military relation soured with the withdrawal of the Indian military training team. But post-1989, once again, Nepal asked for our help in raising large-scale military formations by reorganizing the army from its battalions into brigades and divisions. We have been constantly, continuously been helping out Nepal. I was there, as I said, during the Janandolan. I was there during the time when the PLA uh, was extremely active. And all I can say is that we were there for Nepal at each point of the, of the time when they needed us, whether it was uh, with this ammunition, whether it was weapons, whether it was helicopters, or whatever they wanted. Under Ambassador Shamsaran, I remember we had this uh, bilateral security meeting we used to have, and we would give the Nepalese army anything they wanted. And I, I know for certain that they, they, they were, there were trucks given, there were, the, they were Mahindra jeeps given, the vehicles given, uh, uh, binoculars given, every kind of equipment was given. And we helped the Nepalese army fight the PLA and also ensured that post the, uh, post the Janandolan, the Nepalese army would stay united and would stay the way they are. You mentioned, Ambassador Chinoy, uh, the, the meetings that we've had with the Nepalese army, the Surya Kiran exercises, which were started by us actually at that time at a platoon level and now is at a battalion level, uh, that we, we meant, we, that we ensured that they continue. Most of the issues are focused in the Surya Kiran exercises on, on actually aid to civil authority on problems, what might happen like uh, of the earthquake in 2015, uh, of disaster relief, of uh, fighting insurgency together. So in all in all, whatever Nepal has ever wanted, there was never a no from my side, never a no from anyone in the army side. I remember my chief telling me that whatever Nepal wants, Nepal will get. And that, that at that time, like I said, when JJ was the chief, he, was, he called me one day and I flew down to India and he told me, he said, look, I've spoken to General uh, President Thapa, PJ Thapa, and whatever they want, you are not to say no. So that's been the kind of relationship that we've had with them. I have had the good fortune of visiting Nepal. After that, as a director general of the Assam Rifles, I wonder if you know that Assam Rifles also used to recruit Kurkhas. And we have more than 14,900 Assam Rifle pensioners in, in Nepal, of which almost 10,000 are in this, are paid from the town of Pokhara or the, or the district soldier board of Pokhara. I have sat there and talked to them in great detail. And as you mentioned, and as Ambassador Sood mentioned, besides the fact that we used to pay pension to them by hand, uh, we also used to send medical teams. We still send them. We also send medical packets. We also send whatever they want, whatever Nepal wants, whatever they've ever wanted, they have got. We have given them uh, like helicopters when they were just being inducted into the, into, the, into the Indian Army. And regardless of whatever the thing was, Nepal got priority in every issue. Nepal has, is and must remain, I feel, uh, at, at the head of our, uh, our priorities everything because of its strategic location. The strategic location that Nepal sits on, on the top of India's indo gangetic plain, makes it extremely important. What Nepalese must understand is that India has no defensible lines along the indo gangetic plains. The only defensive lines that we have are across the Nepalese-Chinese border or the Nepalese-Tibet border. So it is axiomatic and extremely important for them to realize that that is the border we have to protect. That is the border that we have to deal with. And because there are no defensible lines beyond Nepal, we in India have to be extremely careful while looking at our security threats. Because immediately as you come, come out of Nepal lies the very 
important and strategic Siliguri corridor that we keep talking about, this 20 kilometer corridor. So, uh, sir, thank you for giving me this opportunity. It's been a wonderful uh, time and uh, I'm here to answer any questions. It gives me the greatest of pleasure to have spoken here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, General Shokin Chauhan. Uh, you have uh, obviously uh, related uh, something that is very close to your heart. You began with that very nostalgic uh, story, a sense of nostalgia. You were reminiscing about your personal experiences. And so obviously uh, Nepal is, as we can see, very close uh, to your heart as it is uh, for all of us. You of course have visited Pokhara uh, in all your uh, military finery. Uh, but I too visited Pokhara once in the distant past uh, in the 1970s as a backpacker, uh, sleeping on top of a bus in the, in the, in the middle of the night, uh, watching the stars go by. Uh, but I must tell you that Pokhara left the same impression on me of being a very friendly place, even though I was roaming around there as a backpacker in the 70s. Thank you very much for those uh, very heartwarming personal stories that you related to us. Uh, we all appreciate your inputs. I now thank turn you. to, thank you very much again. I now turn to uh, Major General uh, Binoj Basniat uh, of Nepal. Uh, he is a retired military official of the Nepal Army. He has served the Nepal Army with great uh, distinction. He is a graduate of the Royal Military Academy uh, Sandhurst uh, Staff College USA and National Defense College India. He is a well-known uh, strategic analyst on South Asian affairs. I request uh, General Basniak to kindly share his thoughts with us. Now the floor is yours, uh, 15 to 20 minutes, uh, as the others have similarly taken about the same time. Uh, the floor is yours, please. Uh, could you please unmute your uh, mic, please? Yes, thank you. I, I, do, I don't get the sound. I don't get uh, your, your sound. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now, indeed. Whatever you did worked. So please keep it up. <laughs> no, not at all, not at all, you're most welcome. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Chinoy and uh, IDSA and the AIDI Nepal. So before I comment, the views and opinions that I express is through intellectual lenses and are my personal and does not reflect any institutions nor the government. First, it is important to observe this subject matter from a regional perspective. This is what I will coin in as a regional security architecture or RSA. And for the 21st century security model, when India, the South Asian rising power is being more implicated with the Indo-Pacific region, with the most recent signing in with the BICA and the Quad meeting that was held on October 6th in Tokyo amidst Nations of South Asia and the world are acquiring space, adjusting to the altering geopolitical circumstances with China-US rivalry. Now, what can or is the vision of the RSA is the question that needs to be answered for collectively being responsible to common challenges. Indian Army is the second largest land based in the world and fourth in terms of military strength and will be the primary actor of the RSA. So the military plays a crucial role in the development of a nation. It facilitates implementations of governments the external or internal threat. The armies in the region go against or set varied visions contrasting the RSA vision. The region will embrace a further instability and even conflict, and both the Nepalese army and the Indian army can't get away from the regional security catastrophe. So in this backdrop, so the origins of security cooperation began after the war in Nepal in 1814, where the Gorkha soldiers uh, were encouraged to volunteer for the East India Company. 
This was initiated after the occupations of Tibet by communist China, raised concerns of security and territorial integrity of Nepal, which drew Nepal even closer to, to the recent independent India with the signing of the 1950 Indo-Nepal Treaty of Peace and Friendship. So in the recent past, some political realm and the perception at large have been influenced and observe things differently now, see Nepal's security relationship with both our immediate neighbors with identical juxtaposition and also extending beyond its neighbors. So an alternative strategic network was expedited with various MOUs, including the transit, transport, and allowing access to the seaports for third country, trade, and free trade routes and join the Belt and Road Initiative. Nepal China Trans Himalayan Multi Dimensional Connectivity Network, including the Nepal China Cross Border Railways Gateway to South Asia. So the agreements focus mainly on seven categories namely, strategic communication connectivity with railway, energy with hydro projects, power trade, infrastructure development, agriculture political and diplomatic gestures and security concerns, as well as military cooperations with the military training, disaster management, medical assistance, equipments for peacemaking operations, establishment of National Defense University in Nepal. This all has regional security repercussions, foremost for the Nepalese army to meet her mandate. So the, the current political Empirical evidence is the visit by the Raw Chief of India, Samad Goyal, and the upcoming visit of General Narvani, Chief of the Army Staff, Indian Army, is being debated and covered with priority on most of the broadsheets and national TVs. So, very responses communicating variations of opinions and change in psychology subsist. So, before I analyze about the visit, let me quote what Foreign Minister Jaisankar said in 2016, quote, political stability and development in Nepal, along with its prosperity is linked to India's security, unquote. The intent of the visits may be a time to materialize this vision of collaborations for a purposeful partnership. So the visit will be significant if the call sets the sights for the beginning of other bilateral diplomatic mechanisms. Both the chiefs of both the armies will be mandated by their respective democratic governments. Nepal, India, military diplomacy or security di diplomacy is an important part of the relationship. As people to people, the civilization relationship cannot be questioned. So is military to military relationship, though other instruments of power do have their own discourse. So this signifies one, the political desire to revisit the cause of distrust. Second, resume traditional practices and expedite other mechanisms. Three, stress that military diplomacy has been the backbone of relationship. Four, an opportunity for the government and the oppositions to bring forward issues that could be brought about for a new course. Five, understanding of India's security concerns in the changing environment. And sixth, other powers like China's growing political influence, questioning the traditional regional security understanding. So the learning moment of time with aged relationship and a new situation. In Nepali, we call it Purano Sammandama Noya Avastha. So this is where the military diplomacy comes in Nepal-India relationship. So military to military ties between our armies encompass establishing normalized institutional security through military, ex military education exchange, conducting military exercises, supplying military stores and equipment, and carrying out defense cooperations. So following the recommendations of the Nepal Bilateral Consultation Group, joint military exercises with the Indian Army began in 2011 that aimed to establish interoperability between the two armies. The nature of threats is altering with the shift in balance of power. So the world is witnessing a crisis of trust, problems in multilaterals, 
cyber criminals, corruption, poverty, terrorism, gender violence and trafficking, and environmental degradations leading to disasters. These are common challenges that need common answers. The Nepali army also began bilateral exercise in 2017, focusing on a terrorism disaster relief operations with the People's Liberation Army. Military to military relationship on the, is on the rise now and exercises with the US Indo-Pacific Army and the British Army is ongoing. So talking about the RSA, the first approach can be the BIMSTIC joint military exercise announced during the BIMSTIC summit held in Kathmandu on 30, 31st August 2019. So the BIMSTIC military exercise is aimed at common efforts to counter international terrorism, illicit drug trafficking, cross-border organized crime, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations, and mutual legal assistance in criminal matters, but was consumed in Nepal with uncertainty, where three arguments surfaced. One, that BIMSTIC was still working for a strong institutional mechanism, vision and charter for capability development. Two, whether it meant a change in Nepal's diplomatic principles of opting for military participations for peace efforts or countering common threats through vision alliances. And three, the fear that strong growing relationship with China would be imperiled. Foreign Minister Mr. Gaiwali clarified that Nepal would not join any military alliances or be used against friendly nations, but would only prepare for natural disasters. The Ministry of Defense articulated on being unaware of the military exercise when the preparation progressed with, with communique. So the Nepali army did not participate in BIMSTIC joint military exercise after government decided to send only observers. So with this backdrop, the bilateral structures and organizations of security cooperations from a local to intergovernmental level exists. There are more than 16 bilateral committees and more than 50 subcommittees for securing cordial environment in several fields, including security. So the way forward, national security requires rearranging, revitalizing and reshaping the defense, the law enforcement forces and intelligence forces. Let me talk about two challenges that the Nepalese army has when it is transforming into a professional force in these challenging times and could strengthen the RSA where Indian army could come in. One, design the force considering the geography to defend the nation against, provide internal security and fulfillment its primary responsibilities. Two, streamline the capabilities for agile, innovative and adaptive army with mobility, high standard of training and the latest arms and equipment. So with Modi 2's government, will be focusing and review and the first neighborhood policy as part of the strategic dealings and foreign policy. And drive development of intelligence capabilities, strengthen military capabilities, Nepal and Indian army need to work as well as bolster efforts for regional stability and bilateral economic enhancement, enhancement through intergovernmental regional apparatus against anti-terrorism regional approach. Uh, energy security, supply security, disaster management, and multilateral strategic connection. In narcotic drugs, fake currencies. So the need is to revitalize the recognition of in Nepal Indo strategic partnership with the RSA. First, India's transulent policy on security cooperation with Nepal. Second, establish defense diplomacy by initiating BIMSTIC SARC Defense Ministers Conference and BIMSTIC SARC Military Chiefs Conference. Third, BIMSTIC SARC Intelligence Chiefs Conference. Fourth, BIMSTIC SARC Law Enforcement Chiefs Conference. So let me conclude. 
political and economic institutions, intergovernmental, international organizations are set after major wars like the foundation, like the formation of United Nations, IMF, GATT, World Bank have helped in the last 150 years to bring the world together and ensure that relationship have not reached in danger to the bring to the new economic society. So it is important that India and Nepal and the region's relationship be strengthened when the world geopolitics is reshaping the Indo-Pacific region and all the trends of flashpoints are in China's periphery. China's political ambitions and rises making China more dependent and connected. And Nepal and India is on the table. India has become more important as well as for India the immediate neighbors in South Asia is even more imperative than before. So Indo-Nepalese ties are unique, time-tested because of deep geographical, historical, cultural, family linkages. Therefore, leaders should not only focus on changing policies, but should also focus on consolidating Nepal, Indian and military relationship to meet the 21st century challenges. Nepalese army should learn from the Indian army modernization, considering the equity, honoring of the past, and ensuring the equity of the Nepalese army, Indian army's future. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Chinoy. Thank you very much, uh, General uh, Binoj uh, Basniat, for your very perceptive and very thoughtful remarks. Uh, you, of course, introduced uh, the concept of the regional security architecture and how our bilateral relations, uh, not just military ties, must be anchored within the uh, ambit of the changing, uh, you know, opportunities and challenges uh, in the context of the regional, emerging regional security architecture. And I, I take that uh, message very seriously, uh, that we must uh, go by Purano Sammandma Naya Avastha. So that is something that we have to uh, work on both sides. By the way, I'm going to uh, try and learn some uh, Nepali as well. So next time when I see you at another webinar, please expect me to say something in, in Nepali as well. It's a very sweet language and I, I want to learn it as quickly as possible. Um, may I now thank you. thank you once again, General. Uh, by the way, you, you seem to be uh, sitting in very sylvan surroundings there. Uh, yeah, luckier I mean, than I mean. most of us who are in, in uh, indoors. Because I could yeah. hear lots of nature, birds, etc. also right. keeping your yeah. company there. So you're a lucky man. But enjoy your <laughs> afternoon you. there. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Take care. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I now request Mr. Geja Sharma Wagle uh, to kindly address us, uh, to share with us his thoughts and observations. Uh, let's say 15 to 20 minutes, please. The floor is yours, Mr. Wagle. Welcome to our webinar. Thank you once again for joining us. Thank you, Ambassador Chinoy. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, level five, all clear. Thank you, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Chinoy, Ambassador Dr. Singhara, Ambassador Su, General Bosnia, General Chauhan, my good friend, Dr. Nai, and my friend, Sunilji. Distinguished diplomats and security scholars. First of all, I would like to congratulate IDSA and AITIA for organizing this webinar on the highly pertinent theme in the wake of impending notificative visit of the Indian Army to Nepal. I wish this webinar's great success. I hope this kind of webinar, dialogue, conversation, and track to processes will significantly contribute to widen, deepen, and enhance the country's centuries old Nepal India relations, including military cooperation and military diplomacy between two countries. Uh, in fact, it is my great honor and privilege to participate in this August gathering. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to IDSA and AIDIA for kindly considering me as one of the panelists among distinguished scholars of Indian relations diplomats and senior security officers of two countries. However, I am not an expert of security and military diplomacy like my fellow panelists. Therefore, I would like to request everyone to consider my views and observations as a student of security and military diplomacy. 
uh, with the kind form of permission of the chair i would like to start with the very special note of our unique bilateral relations nepal india relations are very close intimate unique and special since centuries therefore in my opinion nepal india relations is the vivid symbol of the special and unique relations that is a very rare symbol across the world in fact nepal and india have shared interests and common security threats international terrorism cross border crime climate change disaster and crisis management religious fundamentalism fake currency religious and social harmony cyber security in the digital age human and uh, drugs trafficking are the common security threats of both countries likewise peace security stability economic development prosperity and social and religious harmony in both nepal and india are the shared interests of both countries nepal and india have very close multidimensional political diplomatic religious cultural social economic security and defense relations so that they have very close defense military and security relations and security cooperation in my opinion this kind of special defense security and military cooperation should be further widen defend and enhance to ensure peace security and stability of the region respecting each other's sovereignty territorial integrity and independence this is and should be the fundamental principles of mutual defense and security cooperation between nepal and india taking into special consideration the shared interests and common security threats as i mentioned earlier as far as the security relations and security cooperation is concerned between nepal and india it is highly sensitive issues between the two sovereign and independent countries which is natural in particular nepal has some serious security concern with india which is natural given nepal's geopolitical location strategic importance and security sensitivity nepal has time and again been reiterating india to respect its sensitivity in fact nepal has been respecting and will be respecting the legitimate security concern of india that have been raising through official and diplomatic channels during the diplomatic channels between nepal and india in return india should also respect the sensitivity of nepal without its envelopes nepal and uh, nepal and indian army have very unique and special fraternal relations since centuries is my fellow distinguished distinguished panelist general chauhan and general bosnet mentioned earlier including general uh, ambassador uh, simkara and ambassador sud both armies chief are the honorary general of each other countries therefore general narani is visiting nepal to be conferred as the honorary general of the nepal army samoinasi our right honorable president will confer him the rank of honorary general in a spectacular function in the president palace in fact this is a rare precedence across the world and this kind of very special relations to symbolic have contributed to enhance the multifaceted nepal india relations as per the popular aspiration of both countries people in fact in my opinion this is the hallmark of intimate close and special military relations and military cooperation between the two countries and this kind of cooperation is more important than ever before taking it 
into special consideration the emerging regional and international political, geopolitical, strategic, and security concerns. Likewise, more than 42,000 young Nepali people are serving to India and the Indian citizens through the Indian Army. Citizens of a sovereign country are serving for another sovereign country, peace, sovereignty, and security. And they have been defending another country's unity, territorial integrity, sovereignty, and independence. Moreover, even during the war, some Nepali citizens who had joined the Indian Army sacrificed their lives for Indian security, integrity, and sovereignty. That signifies our uh, very close military military relations, including people with Indian citizens. In my opinion, open border and deep rooted people to people intimate relations are another landmark of Nepal India relations. As a result of the open border, the people of both countries have highly benefited in many respects. However, the unregulated porous border needs to be managed taking into consideration the flash point of security and its negative implication in national security of both countries. In my opinion, another important point is that the Nepal Army and the Indian Army played an instrumental role in lifting the blockade and resuming the dialogue between two, con two countries in 2015 after the promulgation of the new constitution in Nepal and, and the people's democratically elected constitution assembly of Nepal. Therefore, both army have been playing an important and constructive role as per the national interest of their respective countries. In my opinion, military diplomacy is an important aspect of foreign policy for both Nepal and India in the 21st century. And both countries should expedite their available diplomatic tools, enhancing their diplomatic relations and military cooperation, and taking the Nepal-India relations to a new height as per the national interest of both countries, Nepal and India. However, Nepal and India have some outstanding and contentious issues, including territorial dispute and border encroachment. In my opinion, all these issues should be resolved through a high-level political and diplomatic dialogue without blaming each other, undermining the sovereignty. In fact, the armies of both countries can and should play an instrumental role in creating a conducive environment for the dialogue to resolve these out outstanding issues through peaceful diplomatic channels. I am sure diplomacy will prevail and, the, and all the outstanding issues will be resolved through high-level political and diplomatic dialogue as we did in the past. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Geja Sharma Wagli. Thank you once again for your uh, very, very positive uh, and well-considered remarks. You have, uh, of course, uh, uh, mentioned to us uh, the fact that there are uh, issues, outstanding issues between the two countries, and I agree with you that uh, we must uh, maintain uh, deep engagement between our two countries in order to address all issues through dialogue, uh, through diplomacy. Uh, thank you once again uh, for uh, making a very positive uh, contribution, as have the others this afternoon. Uh, may I uh, now turn to Dr. Nihar Nayak, uh, and request him to make his presentation. Dr. Nihar Nayak is research fellow at our institute, the Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analyses. And his area of expertise, as you all well know, is India-Nepal relations. And he's also working on climate change uh, in the Himalayan region, uh, certain other non-traditional uh, security issues, uh, and conflict and cooperative security uh, in South Asia, Maoist conflict and cooperative security in South Asia. So the floor is yours now, uh, Nihar, uh, 15 minutes, please. May I request all other panelists to kindly review their 
uh, mics and to see uh, if they could kindly be put on mute in case they are not on mute kindly do so because that will avoid the uh, you know static and echo that otherwise uh, tends to disrupt the proceedings thank you very much dr nihar nayak uh, thank you sir thank you very much sir uh, good uh, good evening uh, everyone uh, as a last uh, uh, speaker uh, it gives me uh, an opportunity to highlight uh, issues uh, which are not covered uh, earlier because that uh, makes my task uh, easier uh, earlier i thought not to basically focus uh, much on the historical aspect of this relationship but i thought I, th I thought to little bit uh, focus on that because certain some kind of confusion here uh, and no doubt as other speakers uh, um, said that uh, we, we had inherited inherited this uh, this kind of you know, military cooperation from uh, uh, colonial uh, ruler uh, from uh, British. Uh, but at the same time, I, I would like to mention here that uh, the um, history of Indian Nepal military go goes beyond actually British colonial period because for the first time, the talent and the bravery and the valor of the uh, Gorkha soldiers and Gorkha were basically recognized by um, um, then Maharaja Ranjit Singh back to 18th century. And he recruited the Gorkhas into his army, um, whose army was in Lahore, and uh, basically they, they, they are called basically the Lahore or the soldiers of uh, um, fortune. So it, it, that happened around, I think, 1806. And much later, I think the British uh, engaged the Gurkhas uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the subcontinent. So uh, therefore, uh, my, my argument is that with the military to military relations are much older than the firmness of the current geopolitical arrangements of the, both the countries. Uh, so, um, so that is a very important thing we have to remind that it's not the British, but the other, or the one Indian um, um, king who uh, recognized uh, the talents of these uh, Gorkha uh, soldiers. Um, then coming to mind the presentation, uh, the India-Nepal military relation piece often people are saying that is very special. And so we have to identify what are those special elements. That's very important. I have identified around uh, six elements which makes this relationship uh, you know, so special. And some of the elements are already covered by previous speakers. Obviously, and the first and foremost is basically 32,000 Gorkha serving soldiers and the ex Gorkha soldiers who are living in uh, Nepal. Uh, and again, uh, India has often recognized the talents and the bravery and the valor of these soldiers uh, um, uh, and none other than the Prime Minister of uh, uh, India, Sri um, Narendra Modi ji, uh, in August 2014, during his visit to Kathmandu, uh, and he, in the parliament of Nepal, he uh, complimented the soldiers by saying that, I quote uh, Prime Minister Modi, uh, that uh, India has won no war in which the blood of Nepalese have not been shed. So that's the, one of the best compliments I can ever uh, the Gorkha soldiers have received from a, a top political leader of this uh, an international statue. And uh, previously, um, one of the topmost Gorkha army, uh, Gorkha officer of Indian Army, General Maneksha, uh, he also recognized the talents of these Gorkhas and he said that, uh, I quote, if a soldier says he is not afraid of death, he is either lying or he is a Gorkha. So it's the, the talent is very much recognized by India at the different point of uh, time and the different uh, period, starting from the Maharaja Ranjit Singh. And so therefore, in order to maintain this uh, unique relationship and connection and ensure that the work of ex-servicemen and the serving uh, office, uh, serving personnel, say families that depend and uh, uh, dependents are well looked after, um, particularly in the different point of time and in particularly ex servicemen in their uh, older years. Uh, the uh, government of India, with the support of uh, uh, Indian Embassy, runs various welfare schemes for ex uh, Indian Army soldiers in Nepal. Uh, that includes uh, like uh, like a welfare branch. Uh, which is basically um, which has created uh, back to 1952 now it has said the indian ex serviceman welfare organization in nepal and there are many uh, uh, social welfare schemes are undertaken currently including the medical facilities ambulance services educational assistance 
and then providing basically infrastructure in the um, social economy infrastructure in the remote areas, particular facilitator helping these families of this ex Gurkha uh, officials and uh, serving officers or uh, serving personnel. So there are a wide range of I'm not listing but one I can just for the reference for this uh, participants I can say that there's a Bhupu, there's a journal published by our Indian embassy which has started in uh, 2012 and the last uh, that latest you see the 2015. The Bhupu is a journal where you can get the details of this government of India's welfare schemes undertaken in Nepal for this ex uh, uh, Gorkha uh, soldiers. So kindly made for that. And the, the number two element is basically, as I said, that often uh, many speakers have said that the chief of army uh, Nepal army is an honorary gen general of Indian army and vice versa. This, uh, this arrangement has been continuing since 1972. And the most important part of this uh, element of the relationship is basically to that uh, often um, say that uh, the ability to relationship have worked as a savior to the bilateral relationship or the diplomatic relationship during this crisis time. Uh, often we have seen that and uh, someone uh, pointed out that uh, as a subset of the entire relationship, um, the, the, when the larger political relations with diplomatic relations are affected and the subset is also affected, perhaps uh, that is not the case. As my 15 years uh, of uh, research, I found that the two relationships which are not affected by when the state uh, state to state relations or diplomatic relations at a low level, that is one is the people's people's level relationship and army to army relationship. Rather, I can give one example here that in 2015, when this Madhesh is, uh, uh, is protesters uh, had occupied that uh, um, open border, um, that India's uh, former chief of army staff, General Dalbir Singh, and Nepal's former chief of army staff, General uh, Rajinder Chetri, had jointly worked uh, to persuade Indian political establishments to lift the blockade. So here the army is playing a crucial role, particularly helping the state to take relationship to um, in the in the crisis uh, crisis time. And often now when the general Naravane is visiting and the relationship also witnessing at its uh, lowest level, I think again he the, his visit is going to basically strengthen the relationship uh, uh, further because this is going to the first um, high level. Uh, uh, military, I uh, think the visit is happening, and uh, particularly after this recent uh, um, kind of you no know, um, border um, border you know, border dispute between both the uh, uh, countries. And then the third element, the fourth element is basically unlike unlike the transient political, uh, I mean, kind of you no know, uh, level of relationship. Uh, both the armies are permanent institutional forces and are regarded as the national pillar of strength and from the both in the india side and nepal side and perhaps i can say that the visit is happening perhaps like the initiative from the both the army side more than either any kind of political or diplomatic uh, side particularly this current uh, this under um, visit upcoming visit and the fifth element is basically i can say that the india's military aid to the nepali army and that is most important and government uh, and uh, uh, india is the uh, largest and number one uh, in basically uh, supplier of arms, ammunition, and uh, uh, equipments uh, to the Nepal army uh, since, like, as I uh, said, the General Chauhan said, since 1989. Uh, and there is a standing uh, bilateral mechanism which is actually facilitating this all these uh, uh, this relationship, particularly this uh, military uh, military uh, military air that is called Nepal India Bilateral Consultative Group. This is uh, this they hold this meeting every year and they discuss about the requirements of the Nepali army. They discuss about the strategic issues. They discuss about to, how to strengthen the cooperation. They discuss about the joint exercises like uh, Operation uh, Surya Kiran. So the large number of issues they cover during this uh, bilateral consultative group level uh, meeting. And the sixth element I can say that the last is the joint military exercises and operation Surya, uh, sorry, uh, Surya Kiran, which is already covered by other speakers. A 14th round of exercise already held uh, last year. And the major objective of this uh, exercise is basically uh, to basically uh, helping each other during the disaster um, period, particularly crisis time, uh, and fight against the global uh, terrorism and other humanitarian assistance as uh, it will be required at a different point of time um, between both the countries. So basically, to, uh, the major objective is to understand each other, basically having been can bring basically closeness between two armies. That is the major objective of this uh, military exercise, uh, um, uh, Surya. Um, uh, 
then comes to that uh, my, my second part of my presentation is that why is this visit is so important because uh, uh, it is not covered in not extent because the we are holding this uh, program basically to understand the importance of this uh, visit, uh, General Narayana's visit to India. As uh, um, uh, Director General um, uh, Mr. Sujan um, mentioned that this is a regular visit. Obviously, he is going to be conferred as uh, Honorary uh, Chief of Army Staff of Nepal Army. Uh, uh, and uh, this is going to, visit is going to basically when the, both the countries and India basically trying to improve the relationship, as I said, with the border test group. So the visit is going to happen when the, uh, basically to reconnect the relationship uh, at, at this moment. And second, this will be the first high level visit uh, from the India side. And uh, and again, there are many misunderstandings. May not be all those bilateral issues may not be discussed, like the border dispute. Other issues may not be discussed, but definitely there will be a set of a kind of no uh, um, kind of no understanding between both the a state which is which is missing at this moment. And thirdly, I can say that this will be the confidence building visit, confidence 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 building measures visit which would help to restore in the bilateral relations. The visit of the Indian Chief of Army Staff, however, breaks that silence. And uh, it absolutely demonstrates India's also willingness to engage, not the India, but in the Nepal side also. And this has been made possible greatly by the efforts of the both armies. It's not only one side, it is basically messages from the both side. And they have been somehow succeeded in convincing the political establishment that this relation is too vital. That's, that's why this visit is happening. And the visit may not discuss the as it is, as the border dispute, but definitely certainly remove many uh, misunderstandings. And because the, during the visit, uh, uh, General Narabane will be meeting Prime Minister Oli. He will be visiting obviously President. Uh, then he will be meeting the Foreign Minister and other um, um, political leaders also. And he will also address the uh, Nepal uh, Nepal officials uh, also in a, in a, in a special uh, program. So definitely there will be a lot of uh, engagements will be happening during his uh, visit. And uh, most importantly, the Nepal army, the most importantly, it is very important to understand here that the Nepal army's credibility has remained unmatched and is regarded as uh, the most trusted public institution in Nepal. And the currently, this is the, uh, this is the right time to deepen the relationship while the Nepal army is currently commanded by one of the most efficient officers of the Nepal Army, uh, General Purna Chandra Thapa, who is widely revered uh, for his crusade against corruption within Nepal Army, and is also greatly trusted by Prime Minister uh, Woli. So therefore, this is the right opportunity to basically strengthen in the, in the relationship. Moreover, uh, the Prime Minister Woli also values um, General Thapa's uh, victorious and professional attributes more than any other uh, subordinates. So that is very important because since this is such an influential leader, so many things, many issues, many issues and many things can be covered during uh, his uh, reason. And, and, and the most importantly, recently during the COVID period also, uh, Nepal Army's credibility uh, has been further bolstered by the trust it has garnered from all the major powers, particularly India, US and other uh, countries. Uh, these powers chose to hand over the COVID aid to General Thapar uh, and not like the civilian authority that again demonstrates that the trust uh, they pose on the Nepal army and uh, General Thapa's uh, leadership. Uh, despite the request from Nepal army that no, uh, it is not the right uh, uh, no, institution to hand over these items to uh, and uh, better to um, basically approach the civilian authorities. Uh, but still, these major powers, they thought no army is the most trusted and the most reliable institution for um, basically uh, provide this, all these uh, coverage uh, and uh, and, uh, and so that that's why it is very important when uh, this kind of you no know, and the, and the particularly in general Thapa is having so much uh, um, faith in basically India Nepal cooperation and particularly particularly in the uh, military uh, cooperation uh, uh, and and in the, in the last part of my in the concluding part of my in my presentation I will say that uh, uh, the visit will definitely. Uh, is crucial to both the countries, and the visit is uh, the outcome is massive behind the scene of efforts made by both armies. So the compliments should be given to both armies for this uh, uh, initiative, and uh, they seems uh, genuinely intend to exploring the prospects of uh, the resolution and uh, heralding a new era of bilateral uh, relationship. And I believe uh, that like 2015, I think this visit will again 
uh, create a kind of new atmosphere uh, to strengthening the bilateral relationship. And from here onwards, um, many of our existing bilateral institutional mechanism will be resumed because on 15th of December, Prime Minister Oli uh, had a telephonic conversation with our Prime Minister uh, uh, and, uh, and they had uh, 11 minutes of discussion. And then, then after on 17th of August, uh, both the countries had a had meeting on oversight mechanism and perhaps uh, this visit is very crucial and uh, and the joint commission level meeting will be followed after uh, this so i think uh, this is going to be a very uh, important visit uh, and uh, i expect that the relationship will be uh, improved uh, after this uh, after this visit i'll stop here sir uh, thank you very much i like to take question and answer uh, and cover other issues uh, later sir thank you sir Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nihar Nayak, uh, for giving us that overview. And you did sound a very positive and optimistic note, which is how it should be, so given the faith that uh, both sides have in our deep-rooted uh, friendship and cooperation. So thank you once again for your remarks. Now, at this stage, uh, we have a choice uh, of moving to the Q&A session. Um, but I'm wondering if we have Ambassador Manjeev Puri also with us uh, and if so, I could turn to him to make a few remarks because uh, he also had said he might join us. Um, I'm not too sure about it. Only the webmaster will know what's going on. And Nihar, can you mute your mic, please? Yes. Can you please mute your mic? Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, and, and not your video. We are delighted to see you on screen. So please don't blank yourself out like that. Unless you want, uh, you know, to nourish uh, your yourself. Uh, well, anyway, thank you. Um, so let me just turn to the Q and A part. If Ambassador Manjeev Puri is there, we will uh, turn to him as well for a few words. Um, and what I intend to do is uh, actually run through this panel again, because what you might have done is made your own remarks, and you were the tail end, uh, Nihar. So you had all the advantage of reflecting on all that had been said by others that preceded you, uh, but uh, other panelists may want to reflect on uh, what was said by co-panelists. So I'll give them each a, a couple of minutes, please, uh, but I'll first go through the questions here. Uh, there is a general question about how Nepal uh, would view the uh, rise of China or uh, perhaps uh, assertive behavior uh, by China in terms of the broader uh, South Asian context. So that's one uh, point on which uh, people may want to reflect. Um, again, I think it's related to whether any third parties have any interest in undermining our bilateral relations uh, and things of the sort, uh, and especially the close cooperation that we have between our two militaries. Um, one more question relates to uh, the fact that uh, ours is an open border and people do freely cross onto the other side. And so is it at the end of the day, something that um, one needs to consider uh, in regard to any temporary, uh, you know, impediments or hurdles that we might have in our bilateral relations? After all, it's an open border. You, you get the drift of this uh, remark here basically to suggest that since it's an open border, people do move around freely on both sides, etc. Um, how far should this matter uh, be taken in terms of drawing lines when uh, really there are no lines uh, really separating us in terms of the closeness with which we coexist? Uh, so, I mean, this is broadly the thrust of uh, some of the remarks that have come in. Uh, personally, I'm very uh, happy to see the, 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 the very optimistic remarks the forward-looking uh, uh, remarks have, that have been made by suggestions that have been made by all the panelists. So let me now very quickly run through each of our panelists in just two minutes, please, uh, because uh, we have to finish this webinar on time as well. So I turn once again to the very erudite Dr. Shamburam uh, Simkhada. Uh, please favor us with your, your overall comments on all that has been said uh, so far this afternoon. Thank you once again. Yes, please unmute yourself, Ambassador. You need to unmute yourself, not yet. You haven't accomplished it. 
Maybe from That's the, it. Oh, okay. Yes, you're on now. Yes, thank you. Okay, Ambassador, um, I would have obviously uh, preferred that since I started, that if I, I could go the last, but nonetheless, since you've turned, turned to me, that's fine. Uh, in terms of the remarks, uh, on the whole, I think we've had a very productive uh, uh, discussion uh, that naturally has to happen among good friends. You know, I'm so delighted to see some old friends, um, Rake Sood, uh, yourself, Ambassador uh, Nihar Naik, and of course, many others from our side, General Basnet, Giza, Z, and all that. So, uh, if I go from, uh, from the uh, speakers, my only comment um, on Rakesh's uh, uh, remarks is, uh, I agree the Nepali, of the comment on the Nepali media, they are trying to learn from our Indian media brothers and sisters. You know? So I, I, I just uh, want to limit myself to that one. Now, as far as uh, in the General Narwani's uh, comments, about the border. Uh, I have recently written a piece uh, in the spotlight on his visit. And of course, that was uh, in many ways, from the Nepali perspective, a uh, very unfortunate comment. But then subsequently, all the comments that have happened, and of course, the spirit of the visit, I think we need to take a look at things from a more uh, spirit. Uh, and the fact that he has himself decided to come is, I think, an added advantage to clarify many things while not in public, but in fact, in, uh, in, in kind of closed door discussions. Um, on the general's idea, and of course, related also to the, to the question on uh, some of the questions that have, been, that have come, obviously, uh, the general Nepali perception is that China has never had any territorial ambitions south of the Himalayas. So as a result, these old theories of palm theories, or in fact, uh, are they? So that is the general perception. But I agree with the fact that there is a substantial change in the posture that China seems to present. So as a result, sometimes, you know, I understand the, um, the position of the United States, for instance, in taking greater interest in the Indo-Pacific, in some of the agreements that General Bernard Binos Bosnet talked about, the BECA, in the sense that within the framework of the America First policy. But obviously, my uh, wish would be that between India and China, here we have a leader who is talking about win-win relations, who is talking about uh, building a community of common prosperity, common destiny, and in, in China, Xi Jinping. And of course, we have in India such a uh, leader of wisdom talking about neighborhood first and then sabka saath, sabka vikas. But then if this idea cannot be practiced, these very laudable ideas cannot be practiced in our own immediate neighborhood, then what is going to the... I seem to have lost you there. Ambassador, I seem to have lost you there. It's perhaps uh, a problem with uh, bandwidth. I have completely uh, lost him there. So uh, while we wait for him to come back uh, and to conclude his uh, remarks, uh, may I in the meanwhile turn to Ambassador Rakesh too? Maybe you can say a few words uh, till we get him back. Well, um, thank you, Sujan. Uh, very briefly, I think uh, I think it is important uh, for people to realize that uh, the India-China relationship has fundamentally changed. And uh, if our friends in Nepal, uh, they can keep um talking about that you know we wish it was better and i would share that wish but i think uh, the practical reality on the ground is that it has changed and so nepal perhaps needs to figure that out and uh, how they do that is important because uh, 
if Nepal wants to enhance its military relationship with China, as we know, in 2017 was the first time that uh, military exercises between Nepal and China were held. We have seen a strengthening of that in Chinese PLA is providing more assistance financially, et cetera, to Nepal. Now, obviously, if the India-China relationship is going through a difficult phase, then clearly this will not go down very well with India. And I think this is something that uh, both India and Nepal will need to talk about. The second thing, I think that is why I uh, emphasize the fact that you cannot divorce the military relationship from the political relationship. Both countries are vibrant democracies. And so therefore the political relationship is what is going to determine. If we've been able to insulate the military relationship so far, I think we've just been fortunate because we have had an enormous amount of internal political instability in Nepal with 27 prime ministers in 27 years. I think, I hope that that as process has come to an end with the new constitution in a federal Nepal. And so therefore we are going to see far more political stability in Nepal. And therefore it will be that the political nature of our relationship will also determine the military to military relationship. So I think that is important and that we keep that in mind. And therefore, if, as Geja said, there are contentious issues, then I think these are issues that will need to be discussed at uh, a political level, whether it is the boundary or other things, because these are not issues that uh, get discussed at uh, less than that, because it's a very sensitive matter on both sides. Finally, I would say that, you know, uh, we may have continued our recruitment during the time that the Maoists were objecting to it. And I fully agree with General Chauhan when he says that, yes, we stopped it on our own because we didn't want to create a security situation that, you know, we are doing a recruitment rally and India gets drawn into the tense situation between the Maoists and the local police authorities, the local army and the police authorities and so on. Uh, we may have stopped it voluntarily, and therefore we were doing it in, uh, on the Indian side of the border. But the fact is that there is a growing sentiment in Nepal, and I think our Nepali friends are fully conscious of that. And certainly I uh, read the Nepali media and I uh, talk to my Nepali friends about whether they would like the recruitment to continue because we can't just sort of have the recruitment going on on the Indian border and pretend that uh, it is not happening. That's not the answer. If it is a sign of a special relationship, then we need to understand, and both sides need to come to a very clear understanding that this, how this has to be continued. And so uh, temporarily we could have shifted it to Darjeeling or to uh, south of the border um, you know, but uh, I think in the long run, we need to find a way if that is, this is an irritant. And the same holds true for the other uh, contentious issues that uh, Geja referred. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I request Ambassador uh, Simkada to complete his intervention, please? Because we lost you uh, for a while. Please unmute yourself. At the bottom, there is the mic symbol. So please unmute yourself there. Right. Uh, yeah, you're thank on you now. so yes. much. Uh, yes. I got uh, disconnected because you know the uh, the Nepali electricity situation. So I was uh, disconnected for a while. Uh, so I was uh, basically saying uh, uh, in the third uh, that in fact General Basnet's idea that in fact our bilateral relationship in general and our bilateral relationship in terms of the military military are very important and of course they need to be further nurtured and strengthened there's no question about it but you know there is a saying both being uh, uh, our civilizational bond uh, in the rig veda there is an idea called yatha prende tatha brahmande as the microcosm so the macrocosm 
So as a result, in the current world, that in fact, it also needs to be looked at from a broader regional and global perspective. So in that sense, obviously these um, regional and broader uh, developments will have important implications on the basis of which we need to update, uh, redefine uh, our uh, positions. Uh, finally, um, with uh, Nihar's idea, that I, uh, I agree about the historical sort of, uh, sort of processes, but my only point is the military to military relationship is strong, needs to be nurtured for the strength, but they are not necessarily always independent of the broader political and you know economic and diplomatic relationship. I think that is uh, that is very important. So General Narvani's visit, I think, is very important. As I said, uh, you know, we have more or less uh, recognized the development since that unfortunate uh, comment came about. Uh, and between two friends, uh, I think we need to look at the spirit, as I said, rather than any specific uh, comment. But the biggest test of the visit is how will this open the door for ne negotiations at the diplomatic level, at the political level, so that we need to restore the relationship of trust and confidence. And that is what will be crucial for the security uh, preoccupation that India has as a result of the open border. Uh, and that, I think, is the crucial question. And that is what I was referring to earlier in the sense that historically, the two factors that have been very critical in Nepal's continuation as an independent sovereign country is, in fact, that it provides a close relationship with India, but also becomes a stable and peaceful buffer uh, for any extra territorial, extra external, extra regional sort of situations, so that whatever happens outside, what is the nature of a relationship India wants to pursue with other countries, fine. But then within Nepali territory, that in fact it is a uh, a relationship of friendship, peace, peaceful stability. So in that sense, how, as General uh, Basak was saying, how India. India's central role, I see not just in the region, but in fact globally, as well as intellectually. In fact, I see the role of India as being very central, centrality in terms of which way the regional relationship develop, the way global relationship develop. I think that is very important, and I think we need to work very closely in uh, shaping that to the extent that we can help in conference building. Thank you. Thank you once again, Ambassador uh, Simkhada. Uh, for the next two speakers, I'm going to throw in an additional question that's come in from one of our scholars here. Uh, and that is, how do we improve strategic communication between the two countries so that there is uh, no misunderstanding between the two sides? Uh, may I request uh, all panelists to kindly mute their mics, please? All non-speakers may kindly mute their mics. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. So for the next two speakers, as I said, the, the question is, how do we improve our strategic communication? In order to ensure that there is no misunderstanding, there is no chance for anybody at any level to politicize uh, any, any issues or to kind of, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, promote uh, uh, anti the other sentiments, you know? So we need to work hard at that. I suppose the media is also part of that exercise to avoid any kind of politicization. But strategic communication is obviously very important. And um, I'm very happy to say that uh, we have uh, consistently had a very good dialogue with our uh, Nepal, uh, you know, Nepalese, uh, uh, Nepali friends and colleagues uh, in think tanks and uh, various other uh, sort of uh, institutions across Nepal uh, throughout this year as well. May I now request uh, General Shocking Chauhan to say a few words. Thank you, Ambassador Chinoy. There are actually two very dominant uh, perceptions that mirror our relationship with each other. And uh, here I actually uh, go back to history and uh, quote what Ambassador, uh, what uh, the Prime Minister BP Koirala uh, very aptly explained about the relationship between India and Nepal. 
And he said, our ties shouldn't be interpreted on the basis of ancient history and culture only. Look at Europe. It may be one culturally, but they're always fighting and killing each other. Distrust doesn't disappear just because there's cultural affinity. Relationships are dependent upon differing perspectives of society and different expectations of the future. This seems to manifest our relationships with Nepal. We must be clear, and when you talk of strategic communication, I, I must make it clear that what we must be always telling, and I agree with Binod Basnet absolutely, is that the idea of being one, one people, but two nations should always be uppermost in our mind. We must understand that what is good for India is good for Nepal, and what is good for Nepal is good for India. There's another issue that I actually have covered and want to cover again. This is the strategic and unique location of Nepal as far as India is concerned. This is of immense strategic value to India as well as to China. India has traditionally looked at its frontiers, northern frontiers with China, as the Himalayan watershed. The watershed forms a formidable military barrier that can be crossed at selected places only, and therefore lend itself to the strong defense line requiring significantly lesser resources to defend. Therefore, and this Nepal must understand, because I said this earlier, that any Chinese military or ideological influx or influence south of this watershed is inimical to India's interests. And since the mountains of Nepal open out to the great Indian plains, it is crucial for both Nepal and India to understand that these are crucial military interests for Nepal. The third issue, Ambassador Chinoy, that I would like to cover is the economic aspect of recruiting soldiers from Nepal. The recruitment of these soldiers who are not Indian citizens is a phenomenon which is, has no parallel in modern times and is a great benefit to both India and Nepal. There is a number of reasons why this communication and connection should be continued. Recruitment of Gurkhas in the Indian Army is a great economic advantage to Nepal and its cessation would produce widespread distress and discontent. And the second issue, which has not been covered, is for the last 200 years, this 1700 border between India and Nepal has been peaceful. If this recruitment of the soldiers were to cease, then the result resultant economic dislocation and lack of outlet for the inner energies of a warlike and adventurous population that is there as Nepal, India might well be faced with another new and troublesome frontier problem. Therefore, it is imperative that in return for the money which flows into Nepal from India as pension and pays, India receives a guarantee of peace with her international border with Nepal. We must ensure that both of us understand that our relationship is a win-win situation for both of us. We are in this together. We must understand that unless we are, we are in this together and that one relationship is mutually beneficial to the other, we will never be able to, and we will continuously be looking at problems between each other. Thank you so much. Thank you, General Chauhan. Um, may I now request uh, General Basnir to say a few words to reflect yeah, on all this bit that has been said so far. Thank you, Ambassador Ashinoy. Let me uh, three uh, events or po political events. Uh, that has taken place, which has huge strategic impacts. One is we must under, uh, understand the uh, the five policies of the United States, and the other is the impact of good agreement between the United States and the Taliban. And this stresses one is this stresses on the strengthening security arrangements, partnership, and alliance. The second. Uh, it positions, the United States positions uh, competitive diplomats uh, with a larger use of economic tool, like a fair and reciprocal. Third point is the economy is the component of United States national power. And fourth is the China and Russia as competitors that have emerged to challenge American power. So, and the other point is the policy of South Asia. Okay, the United States policy on South Asia, uh, it has called on India to increase its intervention or investments in Afghanistan and take a more active role as a US partner in the region. 
and the other is the United States and the international uh, troops withdrawal from Afghanistan. So with these, let me go to the second point. The, is the trends of geopolitics, let's say in the Himalayan region and uh, China, Nepal, India uh, sector, that is all the center of the, uh, the Himalayan arc. One is that India and China's rapid economic growth, uh, mainly on military, economic, and a political influence in South Asia, with change in public opinion and psychology. Second is the strategic communication networks that has been brought about from north to south as part of BRI projects, and which will upgrade like regional linkages, and it upholds security, diplomatic, economic, and political consequences. And the third is the variety of transportation systems from air, land, rail. So all of these have implications on national and regional security. And the third point is the, the incidents that has taken place in the Himalayan region, where you talk from the Karakam range to Myanmar. And the central part of the Himalayan plays an important part in our Nepal-India military relationship, which is part of the, let's say, uh, uh, important part on the Nepal-India bilateral relationship. And the other one was about the border, like talking about we must start investing, putting our knowledge together on how do we efficiently manage borders so that uh, the people who benefit are not disadvantaged from it. But what is the mechanism, maybe technology, use of technology, use of simple mechanisms that will enhance the security along the borders, maybe a point to think about. And the other is the other mechanisms. And we have so many mechanisms that we talk about, but the joint working communique between the foreign ministers of both the countries play an important role and should also be a significant uh, mechanism for strengthening our bilateral and the strong relationship we have. Uh, I think that I will end here. Thank you, Ambassador Sinoy. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Geja Sharma Wagle. Uh, a few words from you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Sinoy. I think it has been very uh, fruitful and insightful session, and I enjoyed all of and learned all of. I think we share a kind of uh, very political thought, and we come to relate each other. I am a Nepali fellow journalist, Dr. Sinoy, and General Vasan, and I am a fellow Indian. Journalist and Dr. Sohan, and Ambassador I would like to raise a couple of issues. Uh, however, I highlighted the Nepal India relations important. May I request you to speak up a little bit, please? Yes, sure. Could you speak up a little bit or perhaps closer to your mic? Thank you very much. Sure. So, we highlighted the historic uh, facts and figures of, uh, I mean, the very Special relations between Nepal and India, but we have some outstanding issues and we need to resolve them. I am glad that uh, Ambassador Sinoy, Ambassador Ritu, and my Nehar also accepted that very well. Among them, border dispute and open border are very crucial issues. We are talking about the military cooperation, security cooperation, we are talking about the relations between Nepal and India, unless you resolve those kind of very sensitive issues, we cannot have that, that kind of military cooperation as we are discussing right now. So I would like to request government of Nepal and government of India and including Nepal like scholars. And we should uh, start a very uh, kind of formal, informal track and back channels kind of uh, discussion it will create a kind of conducive environment to resolve those kind of contentious and, and pertinent issues. Unless we resolve those kind of issues, we, we can only wish for the catalyst and we cannot create a kind of good relations by wishing the good words. Another uh, issue raised uh, 
first of all, my ambassador to Noit, uh, my first business to India, and just to time as well. We know the very reality that India and China are both rising powers, and Nepal is in between them. And as uh, India saying that they, you have been following the naval to first, naval to first policy, I am not quite sure whether you have a kind of is policy document, what kind of is a view of it. So uh, I would like to hear from my, if I may ask, I would like to ask with my fellow Indian panelists, what kind of naval first policy you promulgated and what you achieved so far, or whether you are going to review this kind of policy. My three questions I would like to put, if I may. As far as Nepal is concerned, as a Nepali citizen, I can say something on behalf of Nepal and on behalf of the Nepali government, on behalf of Nepali people. We need to understand the very reality, geopolitical reality of Nepal. And our government, Nepal Communist Party, led by its chair, KP Sharma Oli, recently promulgated a new foreign policy. True, it has not been publicized yet into the media reports. It reads that the government of Nepal promulgated a new foreign policy that puts neighborhood first. As you, you mentioned, uh, as you mentioned in India, our government has also followed a kind of policy that Nepal gives first priority to its immediate neighbor, India and China. Do we have we, we have own relations with India? We have own relations with China and some Indian media, some Indian scholars blaming that Nepal is a kind of so Nepal is government by a communist government, it is close to China, it is following pro China policy. But we have been raising our issue within the Nepal by my fellow um, colleague General Bosnev and Dr. Simpala. We have argued in Nepali media that we should follow the policy in line with the national interest of Nepal. We shouldn't in incline into neither India or China. This is this is the kind of discourse within the Nepal, but we are in we have some I would standing issues with India, but we are in favor of resolving those kind of all issues through high level political and diplomatic channels. We have been raising those issues time and again through the Bali media and we have been resisting our government, we have been criticizing our government. And we would I would like to also request Nepal and government of India and Indian scholars like us, we should create a kind of conducive environment to resolve those outstanding issues through high level political and diplomatic channel, otherwise we may face some kind of problem as we have shared in and common civic space. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Geja Sharma Vagle for your helpful suggestions as well on the way forward. Uh, I'm sure all of us will uh, look into uh, all these issues with the seriousness that uh, uh, they deserve. Um, and it will fall upon Dr. Nihar Nayak to also address your question that you raised uh, and you wanted uh, an Indian participant to answer uh, your question and query about uh, the definition of the uh, neighborhood first policy of India. Of course, briefly put, it uh, implies just that, that the neighborhood is very important for India and that uh, unless the entire the region progresses uh, together in terms of economic development and growing prosperity and peace and stability. Uh, India too cannot expect to grow at uh, uh, the rate at which we aspire to, to grow. And uh, the second part of that is also that we, uh, under this government, uh, have a policy, neighborhood first policy in which there is an element of non-reciprocity also. That is to say that uh, we do for our neighbors all that we can and we do not expect uh, strict reciprocity. I mean, that element of uh, non-reciprocity uh, is also there. Uh, but I leave it to the academics to elaborate more on that. Uh, Nihar, uh, a couple of words quickly before I turn to uh, Mr. Sunil uh, Casey, CEO, founder of AIDIA, uh, who is, in fact, uh, our partner for this webinar this afternoon. Yeah, the floor is yours. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Briefly, I have one uh, point and one question, sir. You raised about this, uh, in how to improve the strategic uh, communication between Nepal and uh, India. I'll just a little bit touch upon that also. Uh, first, I, I would like to share one thing that 
uh, Nepal is still uh, in political transition. The transition is still, uh, the process is still uh, continuous because the constitution is just uh, uh, five years old. Uh, and most of its institutions uh, are uh, vulnerable to this transition. I mean, I, I mean, some of them, basically, some of the institutions, in fact, uh, new. Uh, and the only one institution which is quite robust and is a permanent one, that is the Nepal Army. Uh, therefore, uh, my uh, suggestion here would be to government of India, would basically, apart from strengthening these democratic institutions, which government of India has been focusing since 1950, uh, India must give equal importance to the Nepali Army, uh, because this is a, one of the most strongest uh, uh, institutions. And in this regard, India should reactivate and uh, regular, regularize the bilateral constitutive group uh, mechanism, uh, basically to ensure smooth supply of arms, ammunition, and equipments to the Nepal army. Because uh, there, there was a point where the government of India withdrew uh, and stopped supplying these uh, uh, very essential uh, items to Nepal army back to 2005 when the period just before the peace process and India was a major actor in that and the Nepal army was very uh, felt, I mean very unhappy with that uh, um, and, and basically decision of government of India so uh, government of India should do, focus this uh, actually notice this sensitivity and ensure that uh, uh, they shouldn't stop this kind of you no know, uh, supply in 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 in, uh, in future. Uh, regarding how to improve the strategy communication, I think the um, now the balls completely uh, actually, actually in India's court actually because there are so many the I mean, contentious issues are there in bilateral relationship, and India as a as a as a big country in this region. Uh, as, a, as a big neighbor, I think India must take initiative in this regard. And many contentious issues, if India takes initiative, automatically uh, all those issues will be resolved. And that will directly or indirectly neutralize Chinese uh, penetration or consolidation in South Asia region. And um, because that will that will automatically because India doesn't have to do any specifically for that. And all those like uh, there could be around ten contentious issues, and India must focus on that, like uh, submission of for EPG report, uh, border issues, anti treaty treaty, uh, all those issues. Then um, uh, water issues, uh, flood issues. These issues needs to be uh, I mean uh, resolved. Uh, I mean it's not a big issue. Uh, then I think the automatically the strategy communication will be improved. Oh, government of uh, it, it doesn't require any special attention uh, and relationship will be improved for, uh, and most importantly as a, as a, and the, the impression of uh, the indian policymakers that nepal is a small state it is not it is dependent more on india that impression of perception needs to be corrected because uh, being a small state is strategically is equally important to india so india should treat nepal as equal partner in future and uh, and and uh, and, uh, and that that is that is where the, uh, the the strategic communication can be a starting point by when the movement will start treating and equating nepal as equal partner i think the automatic relationship will be reignited and uh, it will be strengthened in future thank you sir Thank you, Nihar, uh, again, for making useful suggestions on the way forward. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have actually run out of uh, uh, our uh, stipulated time, uh, but uh, I still have one very important uh, speaker uh, to invite uh, uh, to make some remarks, uh, and this is uh, Mr. Sunil Casey. Um, Mr. Sunil Casey, thank you very much for collaborating with us to put together today's webinar, and uh, I now request you to actually deliver your remarks, which uh, are, are more like uh, closing remarks, uh, after which uh, all that remains for me to do is to simply thank all of you for having come to our webinar today. So the floor is yours, Mr. Casey Sunil. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Chinue, for uh, having me on the webinar. And uh, also, I appreciate to you for accepting my request uh, to organize the joint webinar on the very much important topic in the eve of the visit of the Indian Army Chief to Nepal by November 4. Uh, and uh, let me talk, you know, uh, one of the very interesting uh, thing, like, uh, you know, I have, I would like to recognize, you know, uh, Major General uh, Ashok Mehta, who I, you know, would say that uh, he's the common ambassador of Nepal and India in the military because uh, he belongs to the Gurkha Regiment and uh, 
he, he you know like uh, he loves nepal very much and he had traveled uh, almost uh, part of the nepal and every year he comes to nepal and he is a real great friend of nepal and i would say he is the common ambassador between nepalese and indian military who has been really playing an important role in reshaping the nepal india relations and another interesting story is like when he, when he married in india and he was think that he's a half Nepali. That's why he again did his wedding ceremony in Rara Lake, uh, I mean in Fewa Lake in Pokhara. So that's a very inter interesting story uh, being done by the you know Indian Army officials who was in Gurkha Regiment. So uh, that is what I thought to say, and I really appreciate his efforts in making the relationship very much well. And let me talk you know uh, to Ambassador Rakesh that he said that uh, the statement uh, being floated by the India's uh, Army Chief at the uh, webinar being hosted by IDSA, that was, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, the, that was a political statement and that was quite surprise, surprising to the Nepalese audience and that became very much uh, controversial. Then after that, uh, the Nepalese army, you know, uh, announced the potential visit of the Indian army chief to Nepal. Then the Nepalese uh, people, they become very much angry due to that statement and we actually were not expecting such kind of statement from the uh, Indian Army Chief, as we know that uh, Nepalese Army and Indian Army has the natural relationship and it's a very unique relationship, which you will not find to rest of the world. So I think, you know, such kind of uh, statement uh, may, you know, uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, may impact in our bilateral ties. And I also underscore the importance and the contribution being uh, made by the Indian Army Station and the Nepali Army during the unofficial blockade in 2015, I think, you know, the Indian Army and Nepali Army, they played a very much uh, significant role in opening that uh, way. So that, that is one of the interesting thing. I think, you know, that we should appreciate uh, the effort and that also shows the importance of the relationship between Nepalese Army and the Indian Army. And uh, I would like to, you know, recommend some of the things that uh, uh, India was well, India set up the National Defense University in 2013 in Haryana, India, and the Nepalese uh, Defense Ministry is also planning to set up the ne Nepali Defense uh, University. And uh, Dr. Simkhada is one of the board member of that uh, proposed university. And I think during the visit of uh, the Indian Army Chief to Nepal, I think the discussion should uh, the discussion should happen for the collaboration on the education part for the collaboration between the to institution and the Nepali Army chief was also discussing uh, some uh, year back with the, his Bangladeshi counterpart in Kathmandu that uh, he wanted to set up the uh, military think tank in Kathmandu to engage uh, to his former army officials uh, to give the intellectual output uh, inputs. Uh, in this regard, I think uh, IDS could play an important role in that collaboration. I think uh, that would also make some sense in deepening our military relationship. And uh, another thing is like, uh, I have seen that there has been, you know, uh, the less number of uh, high level visit, visit from India and from Nepal is vice versa uh, in the military uh, uh, spectrum. So I think that in days to come, uh, there should be the frequent visit uh, shall happen from the both sides so that that will help in depending our uh, relationship. And another important thing is like, uh, Many of the Nepali army officers, they go to India in Pune or in Dehradun for the training purposes. And uh, uh, But uh, only few Indians uh, army officers, they come to Nepal for the training packages. And in that condition, I think we have to uh, have the close uh, cooperation in, in this uh, training uh, programs like the mountaineering training uh, and high altitude training in Nepal. I think uh, they should think to set up uh, the mountain training institute in Nepal as well. That will also help uh, to the regional, uh, you know, security uh, spectrum. And another thing, what I would like to say is that Nepalese army and Indian army should think to create the joint task force uh, for the mitigation of the disaster risk uh, management in Nepal, uh, you know, which Nepal uh, shall learn from the Indian army. And uh, we also, the, the both army, has to think that uh, the climate change is one of the important, you know, pertinent issues that is coming and both army can also play the role, uh, you know, uh, in the climate change programs as well. I think you know, these are the points, uh, you know, I would love to share. And uh, once again, thank you, uh, uh, Ambassador Chinue, uh, for being with us. And we do hope that uh, we will organize a similar kind of events in days to come. Thank you so much again for having me this together. Thank you very much, uh, 
Mr. Sunil, for your uh, helpful suggestions and for actually making my job easier. Uh, you summarized the proceedings very well. You came up with a slew of uh, suggestions as well on how we can take this uh, bilateral relationship forward uh, to greater heights. Thank you for all that. I just want to tell you that uh, the National Defense University that you referred to has yet to come up. Uh, uh, and uh, in the meanwhile, the government of India has also uh, passed uh, a bill setting up the uh, Rashtriya Raksha University uh, in uh, Gujarat, in Gandhinagar. It's unrelated to the one that you referred to. Uh, but we, on our part, the MP IDSA, will be delighted to engage uh, uh, one or more institutions in Nepal uh, whenever uh, they are ready at the level of comfort that uh, they choose uh, to, to have. Um, now, with this, actually, uh, we must close our webinar. It, you will all agree that it's been a very, very productive, useful uh, engagement. Uh, people have spoken frankly, candidly, uh, and uh, with expertise uh, and experience at their disposal, too. Uh, between uh, all the panelists, we have immense experience of the bilateral relationship, and I have no doubt that we can overcome any difficulty that might uh, uh, come up in our bilateral relations. Uh, a few uh, major points that struck me, and I'm not necessarily trying to summarize uh, anything that all the erudite speakers have said, that, uh, that would be very difficult for me to do. Uh, but I would simply say that it's very important for the two armies and the two countries uh, you know, to be supported in their efforts to, to move ahead beyond the temporary uh, difficulties. Uh, and that we must have a very stable and peaceful, uh, you know, sort of region, um, and especially uh, the uh, border regions of India and Nepal deserve that. Uh, I'm very confident, as speakers have said, that General Narawane's visit uh, uh, not only reflects the strength of our uh, bilateral ties, but will also be successful. It will achieve its objectives of promoting friendly uh, cooperation between our two countries and notably between the two armies. Uh, Nepal must remain at the uh, head of uh, India's priorities. That's been brought out by a number of speakers, and I fully subscribe to that point of view. Uh, the Indian Army and the Nepal Army have very unique and fraternal relations, and long may it remain so. Uh, and we should all work hard to contribute towards that uh, aim and objective. And I also take the point that uh, in focusing on uh, various uh, stakeholders in Nepal, we must pay particular attention to the Nepal Army, which is a bastion of uh, stability um, and integrity uh, in Nepal. And they've proved uh, their uh, friendship and uh, integrity uh, towards India as well. And we cherish that. Uh, 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 finally, I again like uh, what was said right at the beginning, uh, which is that Purano uh, ma Naya Avastha. I love that phrase because <laughs> it's uh, very innovative, it's very expressive, it uh, gives great regard and respect to the history of our bilateral ties, and it also obvious, obviously uh, you know, requests uh, and suggests that uh, this historical relationship must not be taken for granted. It requires constant nurturing and, and nourishing, and that we must take into account uh, current realities and provide for those realities uh, within that uh, ancient and historical relationship that we have between our two countries. So long live India-Nepal friendship and long live military cooperation and friendly uh, ties between the Indian Army and the Nepal Army. I thank you all very much for sparing so much of your valuable time to be with us at this webinar. We must continue these efforts. Uh, uh, this is also part of our strategic uh, communication between think tanks, between scholars, academicians, and former bureaucrats and generals. L let us keep it that way. Let us engage more, uh, and we will not be found wanting in this regard at all. I wish you all good health and a very good evening. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.